Um, hope everything is. I, <laughs> I love it. I, I, I think it's absolutely marvelous. Uh, right. Uh, I have with me the most super talented, amazing demo devotion from Nonstop. Uh, NSEC Nonstop Electro Erotic. Oh, the word erotic, yeah. A, a cabaret. So at the end of the day, it's an honor to, to uh, have you on the show. Uh, I love the way you, you, you're kitted out. And um, it, it's good. Is that, actually, is that like a mask thing? Does it, does it uh, filter the air? Yes. So it's a, it's a mask underneath a helmet over the top of another mask. Oh, wow, wow, wow. <laughs> but if I had dressed similar, right, I would have had the whole terrorist squad on me. So it's just... A <laughs> <laughs> but you know it all started out when the label said we think you should be a faceless dance act and that was before they'd even seen our faces dav oh. um when they finally did see our faces they thought that was a great decision but what we hadn't anticipated was doing live video chats with people like yourself where suddenly you have to have a face otherwise what do i use a sock puppet oh very true but, but so here i am a human sock puppet in a helmet do you know something? Your, 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 so, so the, the label actually was it the, the label that pushed the idea, or was it was it your original? No, it was it was something where it was quite a bizarre story how we got signed to the label. We we were creating music, we put it on SoundCloud, and suddenly one of the tunes, Mr. Moogie, which is going to be our second single coming out in January, yes. uh, suddenly it got hundreds and hundreds of plays just overnight. It was incredible. It really blew up for us. And so me being me, I, I googled bands, or labels rather, looking for artists. Yeah. Um, the first one that came up was Animal Farm, because that's how the alphabet works. Yes. And I, I sent them Mr. Moogie and said, hi, we've written this thing, it's getting a lot of plays, what do you think? And uh, the head of the label, uh, Vila Lepanen, rang the next day and offered us a record deal. And, and we were absolutely gobsmacked. We couldn't believe it. We approached one person at one label, and he went, fantastic, we'll sign you. And um, it's, it's not quite the, uh, the long, slow road to success that perhaps some of your listeners would be hoping for, but it really was as simple as that. We found the right person at the right label, and here we are. Oh, my God, and, 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 absolutely brilliant. So am, am I pronouncing the name correct? Is it, is it, is it Bill? Or well, we can't really decide. Uh, Vila's from Scandinavia, and so we call it. We've called him Veal. We've called him Vila. We've called him Vil, and he's he's very understanding. He seems to respond to all of those things. I think it's Vila, um, but um, but you know you'll have to ask him next time you speak to him. Absolutely brilliant! Absolutely brilliant. So um, I've got to, I've got to pull pull you up onto it. I think before we called, I was listening to Sy Synthesis Dreams. Ah. And that did it for me. And for me, that's my, my motivational anthem now in the studio here. And that is what I'm going to be playing every morning uh, to kickstart my day before, you know, getting into the sequencer. So tell me a bit. Well, that's fantastic. Thank you. That's all right. That's all right. So, so how did you go about making that? And what was the, the motivation behind that? So all of our tunes start out with uh, Timmy Faith, my helmeted partner in crime. Um, he creates something on his iPad, he creates an instrumental and he gives it a title. So uh, I, I know nothing about the process up until that point. Suddenly my inbox will ping and there's a new tune and it was called Synthesizer Dreams. And um, it, was, it was based on the idea that, that we literally dream about synthesizers. But also, like a lot of our tracks, it has a double meaning. Yes. So we are synthesizers. We are people who create things, which kind of explains the whole middle eight bit, where it says turn on, tune in, create. That's right. And that's the kind of philosophy we have as a band. We want people to, um, you know, find a way of being creative, of doing something, of expressing themselves, because it's a wonderful way to get through situations like we're in now. You can sit at home feeling sorry for yourself. You can watch nonstop 24-7 news, or you can switch off your television set and go and do something less boring instead. And that's what we did. We set out to do something for fun. Hmm. And ironically, several months later, here we are doing interviews and the singles out and we're talking about albums and it, it's been absolutely crazy. But it's because we weren't passive. We were active. We went, OK, we've got some time on our hands. Let's do something wonderful. And uh, we think we have. 
I, th I think you've done something amazing to be honest I, I was going through the songs on, on your SoundCloud page and um, I was very drawn to um, uh, control the nation from my power station right and uh, <laughs> I, I thought what, what, what it was I've just finished I never watch anything on, on the telly or anything and I'm always in the studio doing audio stuff but um, uh, the other half says to me you need to sort yourself out and be a normal human and start watching stuff <laughs> I, I watch truth seekers right and it's funny how at the end of it I don't want to ruin it for anyone but it's basically they're using a power station to control the nation and I thought yes this song I thought it's weird I thought, I thought, I thought, you know I've, I've just finished watching that uh, you know that's worth checking out on prime but I thought so tell me a bit about that, that track control the nation from my from my power station Oh, we have the ice cream van. I will have a uh, 99 with a flake, please. Um, That's not a normal yeah, ice cream I, van, you know. I, 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 <laughs> that is a drug dealing ice cream van. Because uh, th that's our theory about this guy. Regardless, no way. I'm not kidding. Regardless of the weather, <laughs> right, no matter how bad it is, yeah, it could be snowing. There's no one around, you know. Um, uh, uh, this guy is still out there doing his run and I thought that's dodgy and he's been doing it for it's an amazing world we live in Dav it really is where you can have drugs delivered with a jingle <laughs> I mean my goodness me that's um, consumerism that's capitalism writ large right there isn't it it is um, I'm sorry I, I, I cut you off you, you're telling me no no it's quite it's quite alright it was the ice cream stroke drug dealer man that, uh, <laughs> that interrupted but yeah I control the nation so it kind of goes back to an idea where where um, one of our biggest influences is craft work. Yeah. yeah cool. And craft work means power station. I didn't know that. So Timmy wanted to create a track that was um, an homage, if you like, to, to one of our earliest and biggest influences. Yeah. Um, so the, it came to me with the name power station, which is literally English for craft work. So it's got a very, very kind of craft work thing to it. Um, and again, with the lyrics, it's it's very, it's very on the face of it, very simplistic. But as you said about the Amazon series, it's it's one of those things where there's a double meaning to it. So every aspect of our lives are controlled by someone else. So the power station could be a literal power station, but it could also be a metaphorical power station. For example, 10 Downing Street is perhaps a metaphorical power station. It's where ideas are generated, and those ideas which are generated from 10 Downing Street are the ideas which control the nation. So yes, on the face of it, and on the video side of things, if you, if you have a look on our YouTube channel, it would appear to be all about, about nuclear power and the promise of nuclear power and the kind of big disappointment that came after that. But also you delve a little bit deeper and it's about the fact that we, as a nation, we are controlled. It may not even be from number 10, but that's another conversation for another time. Oh, well, I, th I think it's a, you, I understand the excerpt. On, on the, the radio show yesterday, I read out an excerpt from uh, 1984, all well. Oh my gosh! Yes, yeah, I, I, fantastic book. Yeah, I, I, I read it out, and, and uh, you know about you know infinitely stamping on like a boot stamping on a person's face, and that's going to be our our, yes. our our future. So uh, at the end of unless unless like Terminator, there's the resistance. <laughs> <laughs> well, perhaps you and I can start the resistance along with Timmy, and we can change the world one synth tune at a time. Exactly, because because you got make it a better place for the humans. <laughs> You, well, your you, 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 true, your you true, uh, your true wizards are what you do. That's that's one thing. For Thank me. you. I know it's, it's 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 brilliant. So, can I ask you a question? How on earth did you get into it? You know, is it what you, what you wanted to do all your life? Well, I mean, my parents were both musicians, so I grew up in a house surrounded by music and musical instruments. Um, so it was it was kind of inevitable for me. Um, Timmy's parents were really big into the northern soul scene so there, there was never a, a quiet moment in our homes there was always music playing and people dancing and having fun and that's something we've carried through with non-stop erotic cabaret it's about us having fun you know we we have um tried over the years to uh, chase fashion to chase the latest craze um and for this project we said you know what let's just do what makes us happy let's just have fun the irony being that we've become far more successful just by doing something that pleases us. We love what we do, whether 
a million people listen to it or nobody listens to it it doesn't diminish or change the way we love it we just we're very passionate we love what we do we do what we love we're very lucky in that we have a label who don't try and control what we do they just say go for it guys do what you want to do and you know we'll support you and that's a wonderful position to be in you know it really is a, a, a joy an ongoing joy you know we've created somewhere around 30 tracks so all of the stuff you've heard on soundcloud has happened since march it's happened since lockdown all of those songs so it's about three albums worth of material in in uh, in time since march because we said you know what we're not going to get down in the dumps we're just going to go for it. We're going to write stuff. We're going to produce stuff. We're going to make stuff. And we're going to have fun. So what, what is your... That's a big turnout in, t- in terms of... That, that's a, that's, do you, would you call that a heavy work rate? That's a mad work rate? We are quite prolific. <laughs> it, it's one of those things where... I think because it's such a joy to us, it's not a chore, you know? So we, we just love it. When we have any time where we can just do what we want, this is what we want. So we do it. And, um, you know, the turnaround time um, between getting an instrumental yeah. and sending back a that kind of demo version to Timmy, it could be as little as two hours. In fact, we, we had to instigate a new rule yeah. that he must not send me things late at night because I would then stay up all night writing the words and recording the words and then he'd get a track at like five in the morning and uh, we realised this really wasn't good for us long term, you know. So, um, yes, now... New tracks come on a morning, and that means there's an opportunity to work on them. Um, I think the cutoff is midday. I think that's what we decided, because otherwise we would literally just work and work and work and write and write. But it doesn't feel like work. It just feels like fun. And who wouldn't want to have fun 24-7? Oh, my God. I think that's amazing. I'm actually talking to someone signed to a label, and they're saying it's fun and you're not feeling the pressure and i think you're a real credit to, <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be honest because you're um thank you i'm, I'm being serious trust me because the way you guys are working when you said to me how many how many albums have you turned out since march well we've created about 30 tracks so if you think of 10 tracks on an album that's about three albums worth of material and we actually our official releases we're still on our first single so Connected, which is on, on all major platforms, um, is our first official single. Yes. But on the other hand, you've been onto SoundCloud. If you go onto YouTube, for every track on SoundCloud, there's a video, possibly even more than one video, on YouTube that we created. And we just put the stuff out there. We love it. We uh, just do it for fun. It goes out there. People watch it. People don't watch it. The important thing for us is that we've done it, is that we've created it, and that we've enjoyed ourselves. The, see, the thing is, you've seg- segued me into onto the new track, Connected. Right. <laughs> so, so, um, tell me more about Connected, uh, you know, the story behind it. Well, Connected was one of those things, again, it started out as an instrumental on, on, on Timmy's iPad, and I know we're going to talk a little bit about technology later on. Yeah. Um, and it was one of those things, one of those tracks which immediately spoke to me in terms of what the lyrics should be about. It immediately said, this is what it's going to be, this is what it's going to sound like. Um, and it was one of those that came in about 10 o'clock at night and I stayed up till 5 o'clock in the morning creating a whole mix of it to send back to Timmy because I was genuinely excited about it. It's one of the first things we did and I was so excited to be working on something new with my old DJ partner. Um, and again, with the lyrics... It's a, it's a fantastically uh, memorable, danceable, sing alongable tune about ooh, being connected. It's all, it's all sweetness and light. And then you listen to the words, you listen to the lyrics, and it's saying, you know, it's fantastic to be in a connected world. But just be a little bit careful about how much time you spend online, where you spend your time online. And when people are telling you things yeah. via your devices, you need to think, who's telling me this? Wow. Why are you telling me this? What's your agenda? Why are you presenting me this information? I don't know if you've seen uh, the film The Social Dilemma. Um, it talks about how how the algorithms will keep feeding you the things that you click on. So all it takes is for you to click on one, let's say, conspiracy theory about ice cream vans selling drugs. <laughs> 
um, which may or may not be the case. Yeah. But you click on one video, yeah. and then it will present you with three or four other videos. And before you know it, you've disappeared down a rabbit hole of weirdness and pe- peculiarity, most of which is poorly researched, most of which is a person's opinion. Yeah. But it can be very easy to think that what you're looking at, what you're experiencing, is fact. When at best it is what I like to call faction. It's fact and fiction mixed together, like which kind of describes that movie. It's fact and fiction mixed together, and you have to take from it what you want to take from it. But what we tend to do as humans is we take from the media we consume the things which affirm our beliefs. And uh, like I said, it's a, it's a weird rabbit hole. You need to apply your critical thinking skills and think, OK, well, this person's saying this, this person's saying this somewhere between the two is probably where the truth lies um which all makes it sound very serious and if you've heard the track which i know you have yeah. I played it, out yesterday. it doesn't sound serious it sounds like a, a classic dancey disco kind of track it's a brilliant track but there, there is a meaning in there there is thought that goes into it um in fact this thought goes into all of the lyrics i think i can tell it's it's um you, you, it operates on a, on, on a surface level, but when you delve deeper and you, li- you listen to the track and you really think, there's a, there's a meaning and you think to yourself, right, so the, the motivation behind it. So um, you guys work, you and Timmy work work remotely. Now, is that... Is that we do. Yeah, so tell me, is that not, that's not just due to lockdown, is it? No, we really don't like each other very much. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's completely not true we are we are great friends yeah. but what we find is as great friends when we do get together yeah we chat yes we chat about life the universe and everything yes. when what we should be doing is concentrating on the music and, and we used to work together side by side but as you'll know as an electronic musician yes whoever controls the mouse they're in charge <laughs> Whoever controls And there's only one mouse in most cases. Um, you know, so there's one person sitting doing all the work, and there's one person sitting, in that case, usually me, uh, sitting having a cup of tea going, oh, you should do that. I'll make it do that. Um, and we found that, that our productivity, when we stopped trying to work side by side yes. and started sending things backwards and forwards, it increased enormously. That's the only reason I think that we managed to create so many tracks in such a short space of time is the fact that we're not sitting there going, well, I think it should be this bass drum. No, it should be that bass drum. Well, what about if you have this? But we're not having those discussions. Timmy presents me with an instrumental that is finished as far as he's concerned. This is it. Then I take it. I write the words. I send it back to him. He then sends me some feedback and the wabs. So I deconstruct the whole track and I rebuild it again like a wonderful Lego set um, and create space for the vocals and add what uh, one reviewer calls sonic garnish, oh. which did make us laugh. Oh. So all of, all of the little tiny bits that you hear, yeah. um, there's, a, there's a track called um, Hype Beast, yes. where I talk about Hype Beasts flushing their life away. Um, the sample of a toilet there. It's from my, my big sample collection, my Sonic Garnish selection, which I've collected over a number of years, all legal samples. Um, and again, talk about having fun. I put things in our tracks that make me laugh that I know will make Timmy laugh. So it's, it's you know, who's expecting in that song the sound of a toilet flushing? Nobody's expecting that. You know, there's tracks where you've got... Um, little samples from pac-man machines or you've got samples from star trek or star wars yes. and really i i'm doing it for me and i'm doing it for timmy and then what happens is people listen to it and go oh wow i, I didn't expect that's kind of weird that's kind of strange and you think well i suppose it is strange but it's really it's like a couple of stand-up comedians just amusing each other and if the audience are there well that's great but we're just having fun how did you and timmy meet we met at a music festival, rather appropriately. Um, so Timmy was a friend of my wife, and uh, we met in a field. I seem to remember Timmy had um, had uh, dreadlocks at the time, yes. uh, which was quite quite incredible. Um, it was one of those things where we just got on really well. And uh, I was running some club nights at the time, and Timmy told me he was a DJ, and I was like, oh, you have to come and play at one of my club nights. And, and nine times out of ten, when you say that to someone, you never hear from them again. Yeah. yeah. Only this guy got in touch 
turned up with his records and he was fantastic far better than me so i was a dj club promoter who then brought somebody in and he was great he was fantastic so he, he kind of put his records where his mouth is if you like he was wonderful and we worked together ever since um he did remind me the other day that for quite a while there i was his manager <laughs> brilliant stroke agent so I, I was basically thinking this guy's great i bet i can get so much more money for him than he can because of course he's the quiet half of the partnership um, and so i started uh, booking him into other clubs and venues and stuff and you know he's fantastic he really is and i'm, I'm, I'm a big fan but don't, shh, don't tell him because we don't he's getting an ego the size of mine now do we one thing i have to say i've picked up just from talking to you just for, for a few moments is um your, your, is it fair to say that you're serving your purpose in life? Well, that's a very deep philosophical question, but I will try to answer it. I think we all have a duty to make the most of our talents, whatever they may be. Yeah. And I think it's a shame to have a talent and waste it. Yeah. And that's certainly something that our parents have always encouraged. If you've got a talent, go for it. Do it. But it also has to be tempered with a kind of thing um, where you, you must you must do no harm. You must try and make the world a better place. Yeah. So if your talent is cat burgling, um, perhaps your talent shouldn't be utilised <laughs> because it's not making the, it's not making everybody else's world a better place, is it? Sure. But if you are a talented sports person or musician or writer or whatever it is that you do that you do really well, you make fantastic cakes. If you can share that with the part of the world that you inhabit, and everybody did that and made a little bit of the world they're in a little bit better every day, yes. then the world would be a nicer place to be in, wouldn't it? It certainly would do, yeah. It, it, so you've got a great outlook on life and a great philosophy. And um, how do the family, uh, how do you juggle that with the work rate, or do they get involved and say, yes, yeah, sure, that, that sounds all right, you know, Damo? Or, you know, how, how are. <laughs> Um, well, I, I'll certainly talk about my, my side of that, which is that my wife, um, whenever I play her a piece of music, she will say to me, that's the best thing that I've ever heard. And that's the end of the conversation. Uh, she's really not particularly interested. She loves the fact that I love doing it. But she's not really a fan. Um, so she's very supportive. She also likes peace and quiet. I'm not a quiet person. Um, so she likes the fact that I take myself off to my studio. If I've not um, spent enough time in my studio, from her point of view, if she wants a nice quiet weekend, she'll say, haven't you got a track you could be working on? At which point I go, oh, yes and i disappear for 10 hours and she gets a nice peaceful afternoon reading a book or watching tv so in, in that way she's very supportive yeah. but in a kind of peculiar way and um timmy's wife is exactly the same you know there is a time to be with the family yeah. there is a time for in his case timmy time where, where it's time to put the headphones on get stuck in with the music and it's important because otherwise you can't balance things yeah. You have to be all things to all people. You have to make the world a better place. Um, and you can't do that by ignoring your family and ignoring your friends, can you? That's a very good point you just made there, you know. It's very, very true. So I'm like a hermit. So I need, I need to learn learn from what you just said. Very true. Very I think everything in moderation, Dav. Yeah. It's fantastic that you, you love your synths and you love your music. Yeah. But I think... It can't be to the exclusion of everything else. Yeah, it's true. You know, it's one of those things where there's a time for everything. I also find that the more things that I have to do that aren't to do with music, the more precious my time in the studio becomes. So the work output increases. I haven't got a year to create a track. I haven't got a year to create an album. I might only have a couple of hours at this weekend that I have to dedicate to it. But when I'm there in the studio, I'm absolutely focused. And you'll know yourself. Yeah. When you're working on a piece of music, you can't really think about anything else. It's all consuming. Right. And, and that's, how 10, that's how 10, 12 hours just fly by. Because you, you suddenly you look up and the sun's coming up and you think, oh, it's, it's that, that bit where you go, it's almost there. I'll just change this. And then, of course, you change this, then you change that. And you need to redo such and such. And actually, the vocal's not as... And before you know it, hours and hours have flown by. Um, but that's part of the joy of it. it it's the gift that keeps on giving. 
So, are you fussy? In terms of the Sonics? Uh... <laughs> <laughs> wow, now that, there's a million dollar question. I, I think we are very fussy. But there is a point where your fussiness gets in the way of your productivity. Yeah. yeah. You know, so, yes, I can sit and work on and listen to the same 30 seconds of music for hours and hours on end. But there has to be a point where you say, do you know what? It's good enough. Let's get it out there. Let's put it on SoundCloud. I don't think anything is ever perfect. I don't think anything's ever finished. And that way madness lies. If you just keep working on it and working and working on it, there's a certain joy to that. Yes. But there's also a certain joy with saying, that's done. Let's get on to the next one. And what we find is, as, as we've been writing and writing and writing, everything we work on is the best thing we've ever done. Oh, wow. Wow. And then we create a new track, and that's the best thing we've ever done. And it's not necessarily that they're getting better. Yeah. That's not for us to say. But what it is, it's the joy of having something new and taking a, a literally a blank screen and creating something where nothing existed before. That's a wonderful thing. What an amazing creative process to start with nothing and then have something. What a great place to be. That is a great place to be. Uh, what I was going to say, you know, with your, you just mentioned about you, your, each track you do is the greatest thing, you know, your greatest, greatest piece of work. Now, is that like a creating a pressure on yourselves because you've set the benchmark see, on the last track and you're thinking, oh no, I've got to. Do you have that pressure within yourself? You know, to beat your own benchmark? No, I don't think we do, to be honest. It, it's just one of those things that seems to happen. You know, one of the great things, again, about music is that you're always learning. There's always something, there's always a plug in where. It's called XYZ, and you think, I wonder what XYZ does. So a, a recent discovery of mine in terms of plugins was the Enigma plugin, which comes with uh, the Waves bundle. Other bundles are available from other manufacturers. Yeah. But it's, it, it's something that I, I didn't know what it was. It was literally an Enigma. I hadn't read about it. It was just sent to me as a package. And, and I, I tried it, and I thought, ooh. <laughs> I still don't know. I, I still don't know what it does, but I like what it does. And so it started sneaking into tracks. And um, I've just written a track called uh, "The Spy Who Raised Me," and I can neither confirm nor deny that my father was part of military intelligence. And what I can tell you is, I wrote a song called "The Spy Who Raised Me," and of course, part of the song is about us visiting Bletchley Park. It's about seeing the Enigma machine. Yes. And the first time I used the Enigma plugin was the fact that I was thinking about the Enigma machine. I was writing the track and there was this Enigma and it just kind of seemed to fit. It was all those things that just went, oh, yes. It would be rude not to use the Enigma plugin when you're talking about the Enigma machine. Could you please educate the dumb mind, moi, on the Enigma machine? So the Enigma machine was what was used in the Second World War to decode German secret coded messages. And it gave us an advantage um, in the Second World War because we could see what they were doing and where they were going, what they were doing. And the weird thing is about when we went to Bletchley Park, I took my father um, towards the end of his life. He said, you know, I'd really like to go to Bletchley Park. And I said, well, let's, let's do it. Let's go for it. Took him down there, went into the house, and he went, well, it hasn't changed much. And I suddenly went, what? It hasn't changed. So you've been here before? At which point he said, I can neither confirm nor deny that I've been here before. But it hasn't changed much. <laughs> 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 so it's one of those weird things where, where suddenly with the whole story of my father's life and the time before I was even a twinkling in his eye, suddenly all these things started to make sense. Um, and all these little pieces fell into place. And um, even to the end, he wouldn't, he wouldn't talk about what he'd done, and where he'd been and, and the things he'd been involved with. Um, but for example, he wrote a song yes. about John F. Kennedy. Yes. And I always thought that was a bit odd, a British guy writing a song about John F. Kennedy dying. You know, it's, it's kind of, that's a bit odd. Um, and of course, it turned out he'd worked with him in Washington, D.C. So he was writing a song about somebody he knew 
And I never knew that he knew. I just thought he was kind of like writing a song about Elvis. I don't know Elvis, but I could write a song about Elvis. And my father was writing about John F. Kennedy, not necessarily just the president, the president that he'd worked with. And that, that kind of blew me away, that, that whole secret life that he had before I was even born. That's amazing. That is, that, that is that absolute, I wonder how your mum feels about it. Well, unfortunately, she's no longer with us either, Dav. So I never really got... That's quite all right. I, I've never got the chance to ask her. And it was a kind of unspoken thing. We knew that my father had been in the military. He'd been in, um, involved in all sorts of things, but we never spoke about it. And it kind of... Um, the stories went with them. Yeah. And that's probably how it should be. I'm not saying my father was a James Bond kind of guy with an Aston Martin. Um, you know, he had a very nice Mercedes, but he didn't drive an Aston Martin. Um, but he was one of the people involved in that kind of espionage or counter-espionage, codes and ciphers. Um, and that was all years and years before I came along, years and years before my mum came along. You know, he was... a. a um, a fantastic man and a, and a big influence a wonderful wonderful mandolin player um so that, that's where i kind of got the music from was he was a mandolin player mum was a, a piano player in fact my father ended up he could play any stringed instrument he ran out of stringed instruments so we started making them and so I, I have in my studio i have a whole collection of instruments that my father made by hand and then learned to play because he was that kind of guy and i many ways i am my father's son i am such an enthusiast wow wow so you are serving like your uh, your, your purpose and that genetic code there is, is working as well well it's that whole argument isn't it between nurture and nature yeah, that's right. It, it's right it's... are people born with musical talent or do they grow up surrounded by music as I did? And it, it wasn't just folk and country. It was classical music. It was opera. It was all of these things were always on the record player or on the wireless. Um, as, as my father called it to the end, it was always the wireless. Um, and to be surrounded by that is an absolute gift. It's an absolute joy. And you never know. I've just been put, putting um, um, some finishing touches to a new track we're working on. Yes. Um, and I found myself putting on orchestral strings and doing a string arrangement for the middle eight. So suddenly it's this synth pop song and then suddenly it's, it's an orchestral song and then it comes back into synth pop again. And you think, well, where did that come from? And it can only have come from the time I spent listening to those, that kind of music as a child growing up. Wow. Wow. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to watch that film called uh, Social Dilemma. And yes. I... I have. I, may I recommend a book for you to read if you haven't already read it? Certainly. Um, I think it's, uh, it's by Preston Nichols. Um, is, it, is it the lost? It's not the lost waves of time, I think. But Preston Nichols. Now that guy was an engineer who set up, built the studio for Phil Spector. Ah, right. And then that was uh, he was involved a lot in the whole MK Ultra and. Um, Gosh. The use of sonic uh, weaponry and um, yes, mind control. Uh, you know, so that I've, I'm very, very interested in, the, in these things. I, I read on my downtime whenever I get it. Oh, on these, on these. Fantastic. Yeah, and I'm also a great fan of uh, of Dennis Wheatley. I have the entire collection behind me. You'll see there. Okay. Okay. I'm writing Dennis down as well. Oh. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's it's one of the one of those things where where um, you create something wonderful. Yes. You create a, a sound generating machine, yeah. and before you know it, you're on a top secret military base, and they're trying to weaponize it. Nobody ever seems to have the funding to take something and make the world a better place. And I kind of think that's maybe where we come in as musicians. Yeah. We're taking these things, and we're not we're not creating uh, propaganda to make the world a worse place. We're creating things that make people. If only for three or four minutes, just forget about the outside world and enjoy something. That's a positive use of it. The thought that somebody might come along and whisk me off to a top secret location and say, OK, you've written a really nice song called Connected. How can we use it for evil? Um, I'd like to think I would, I would press the stop button at that point and go, 
I'm not doing any more music and I'm certainly not doing it for you. Wow. I'll do something else. I've always liked table tennis. Why don't I take up table tennis and become good at that? Um, I'd rather do that than cause harm to anybody anywhere through the music. What a beautiful outlook and a great philosophy and a great energy. Um, Thank you. No, no. Uh, real talk. Um, now, environment. Are you... You're the creative environment is a very, very important uh, place right now. What things do you do to ensure you have a creative environment? So I have one room in the house where I am truly in control. Brilliant. The majority of our house is beautifully zen-like with white walls and cream carpets. It's very serene, very much reflective of my wife. Yes. My studio is what she likes to refer to as an explosion in a crap factory. <laughs> okay? So I have all the things that I love surrounding me in my studio all the time. So I'm surrounded by instruments. I'm surrounded by art. I'm surrounded by signed records and Star Wars memorabilia and little robots and all of these things that make me feel like I'm in my happy place. So people often have a mental happy place. I have a physical happy place. My studio is my happy place. And hopefully that comes through in the music. You can hear that I'm completely unworried. I'm completely unbothered by the outside world because I'm in my little studio cocoon and I'm doing what I love to do. Um, and that's really nice to have that kind of space. I know I'm very, very lucky that I have this space. I'm very, very lucky that, um, to have an understanding wife who allows me to have this kind of strange life that i lead um, and is very supportive about it providing the star wars toys don't spill out into the rest of the house at which point they'll be in a bin bag and on the way to the tip oh bloody hell wow wow <laughs> um, I'll, I'll i'll hit you you may have noticed behind me uh, there is a huge copper pyramid yes yeah now the story behind the Copper Pyramid was um, I researched the work of Flanagan and all the rest of that and uh, the use of pyramids and vortex energy and stuff with my downtime too. So, um, okay. Uh, that regarding creativity and vivid dreams, that's why if I can get a nap in a studio, you know, when no one's about, and I get, <laughs> that sounds nuts. That's why I asked you the question about environment, which is very important. Right. Yeah, yeah. So certain things. So, do does the dream element uh, play an element play a part in your production in ideas? Well, absolutely. It's very strange where ideas come from, and, and um, particularly the track you mentioned, synthesizer dreams. Mm. Um, after I received the track, yeah. I literally had a dream about synthesizers. I literally dreamed about electronics and plugging things in. Um, and then it became something more than that when it came to writing the proper lyrics. But yes, it was an idea of oh, a synthesizer dream, a dream about synthesizers that then became a dream about being a synthesizer. And, and where the ideas come from, who knows? It could come from, from a higher power. It could come from the recesses of your brain, something you've read, something you've seen. Um, but I do find that I'm inspired by Timmy's music. And, and the words, they come very easily to me because I'm in the right space and i'm in the right environment um you mentioned pyramids and I'm, I'm fascinated by the idea of pyramids and i was very lucky to go inside the great pyramid yeah. um in giza yeah and uh, have you been in there uh i was gonna go uh i i, 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 I will go that's a, that's a cheops pyramid so the angling is at 51 point something degrees on that one isn't it? so it's very strange inside that pyramid is a very strange powerful experience that i would urge you to uh, to visit when it's safe to do so it's a very strange thing and i know there are all sorts of theories again if you disappear down a rabbit hole on the internet you will see people talking about the fact that it's not a burial pyramid it's something else and it may be to do with channeling power or energy or or even generating electricity and distributing it across the world um and that kind of idea that's fascinating that there are cultures, civilizations of which we know nothing about. Um, the pyramids predate the Egyptian civilization oh, yeah. by thousands of years. Yeah. 
that's a bit of a mind blower because you're brought up knowing that the pyramids, oh, they're burial tombs for that dynasty. And then you find out that they're not. And you think, hang on, what's going on here? Um, so there's, there's more there's more to life than the, the accepted reality in which we live. There are other realities. There are other histories which we don't explore for whatever reason. Um, you know, perhaps... Uh, we can talk another time about all the craziness that's out there on the internet. But again, some of that craziness, what if it's the truth? Oh, yeah. Talking about um, truth. Now, I bought this meter and it, it measures um, electrical and magnetic, this electromagnetic meter. It cost about 160 quid. Now, what wow. did with this meter? Right. Put my arm literally behind myself into the pyramid. The, re the reading shot just hopped pulled it out the pyramid it dropped down I thought what the hell is this so then I I <laughs> contacted him I thought can I being an Indian man right and I thought okay I'm gonna, I'm gonna find a way to save on the lecky bill right <laughs> in the studio <laughs> <laughs> so then I thought what I'll do I'll put together like a Tesla coil sort of thing and I will uh, capture wow. capture this and store it in a battery and all that but that was uh, I, I didn't get around to that but I ended up contacting this professor in the States who was a specialist in uh, nuclear energy and fusion and and quantum uh, quantum energy? So uh, at the moment we're working on this, doing the research for um, for the for these uh, the forehead the forehead plates and tablets of the Calusa Kings, where wow. so ignore mobile phones. So where one person could see in here, what the other person could see in here, a hundred miles away, and so uh, the, that's incredible. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think they call FM links form form material links. Wow. I, I don't know much about these things, but I, I'm learning. But uh, all right. So, you, who inspires you and motivates you musically? Well, I, I don't know if you'll be listening, but I have to say, just between you and I, it's Timmy. Timmy. Yeah. Yeah. Honestly, yeah. Timmy Faith's music. Better. inspires me literally and figuratively because i never know when it's going to arrive yeah. i never know what it's going to be like uh, we have no rules uh, we had somebody on one of the uh, one of the internet uh, forums um we posted a track and he said this isn't a retro wave and we replied well no it's not did, did we say it was going to be um that was a track we did called Don't Be Mean to Belle Delphine, which I think is, is on our uh, on our SoundCloud. Oh, it's about and that, well, that, that came from um, YouTube feeding me a video, not by, Del, uh, by Belle Delphine, yeah. but about her. And it was two young guys yeah. just being mean about this young lady. Hmm. And I thought to myself, well, that just won't do. You know, you may or may not like what she does. And if you don't like what she does and the way she does it, then don't watch it. You don't watch it and then pick on her. It's like uh, the, the cyber bullying. It's like the equivalent of playground bullying. I do that. If you don't like her, don't just watch something else. Do something. It's not like there isn't anything else to watch on YouTube. Very true. Very true. And so we, we created this track. Um, and yes, it wasn't... Uh, it wasn't retro wave or synth wave or anything like that. It was a pop song. Yeah. And it was really based around the idea of just don't be mean to Belle Delphine. And again, not just about Belle herself, but about all people that are out there making their way, doing something creative, doing something to earn a living. Yeah. And then other people sniping at them and getting at them and, and just, just being rotten to them. There's no need for it. If you don't like it, listen to something else, watch something else. If you do like it, fair play to you. But don't sit in judgment when somebody's doing something and being a success. And I think that's the key. Yeah. That's when the uh, the knives come out. Is when somebody's doing really well, and other people are trying to capitalise on that. And so really, it was it was something. And we sent it to Belle. We sent it to Belle, and she said she she loved it, which was which was uh, very flattering. Um, but it's one of those things where again, trying to make the world a better place. Yes. We make the point in the song that you might think of this character, and she is a character, Belle Delphine. Yes. But Belle Delphine is also a real person. Belle Delphine is also somebody's daughter, somebody's sister. You know, she, she's a real human. Mm. How can you be so rude about a fellow human being? That makes no sense. That's not good for anybody. No. You know, if you don't like it, 
don't watch it. Yeah, very true. I see. I was going to ask. That was that was on the list. That was question number uh, number six about uh, what what's the story behind "Don't Be Mean to Belle Delphine." So. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I, I need to I need to delve more into the the Belle Delphine story, and okay, to, to, to learn more. So, um, is there like I'm neither an expert nor a fan, Dave. I have to point this out. It's all right. um, had had somebody not been mean about her and had it not been recommended to me, I would never have heard of her. Um, so I'm not an expert, but I'll do my best to answer your questions. Uh, I, it's, it's, it's fine, but if uh, what I'll do, I, I guess I can Wikipedia it or, or, or Google it. I think. Can I, I do that rather than uh, trouble you? <laughs> oh, honestly, I don't know a huge amount about her. Yeah. I gather she makes her a living from making what I would describe as possibly. She started out making makeup videos. Oh wow! And then she moved on to being slightly more risque. So was it? She was a perfectly normal, average teenager. Yeah. Now, this is how I do my eye makeup. That kind of thing. Yeah. And then at some point, it got a little more grown up, I guess, as she did. Yeah. Um, and from what I gather, she makes a very handsome living um, being Belle Delphine, oh. being this character, playing this character and um, catering for people that like this kind of character. Um, she did when we sent her uh, the track and she said, oh, I really like it. Well, perhaps you should send me a tribute to which I replied. That is our tribute. We're not going to send you any money, Belle. We're not really your target demographic, but we just got a little bit annoyed at people being mean about you. And so this is our gift to you. Um, you know, if, if you're not happy with it, if you want us to take it down, then we will do. But just know it came from a good place. We just wanted to, to say, no, hang on a minute. Don't be mean to Belle Delphine. The fact that it rhymes and scans really well. That really helps. Yeah, it, re it, re it really does. Um, <laughs> so, um, craft work, orchestral manoeuvres in the dark, human league visage. <laughs> 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 we really should listen to more contemporary music. I know that. Yeah. Um, in fact, Timmy's recently confessed to uh, to liking Billie Eilish. Oh wow! Um, which is a, a a wonderful but slightly worrying turn of events, <laughs> um, because there's only one Billie Eilish, and she's already it. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm I'm hoping it will be a positive influence, an influence for good, on our music. Um, but no, really, the list of bands that you that you've, you've spoken about, they are. The bands that really float my boat, the bands that I go back to time and time again, the bands that I listen to in the car, um, and, and my my sort of playlist in the car is pretty much the greatest hits of synth pop. Wow. You know, it is all of those bands. It is all of those, and there's something, there's something genuinely wonderful when I when I think about it. What's what's the link between all the things that I like? And it's synthesizers. It's that idea of they create. You turn them on, and there's nothing. And then you create something, whether it's by plugging things in or tweaking knobs or, or sliding sliders on a screen. You're creating something out of nothing. And somehow, despite having been around for such a long time, somehow it still manages to sound like the future. Wow. And that's an amazing thing. You know, guitars, guitars are great. I love my guitars. But they sound like guitars until you plug them into a synthesizer, at which point all bets are off. You can do all sorts of things with them. But the synthesizer, the idea of it, the sound of it, I don't know if you know the story about Gary Newman. Gary Newman went into the studio to record a punk album. Pyramid. He walked in. Yeah. Exactly, the pyramid. You've just reminded me that he used to perform in a pyramid. That's where his power came from. Um, and he walked into the studio and somebody had left a Moog synthesizer turned on in the corner and he pressed it and the whole room vibrated and he went, well, that's it then. <laughs> that's what I'm going to do. And that's, that's such an amazing story and he's an amazing guy and he's so nice and so so pleasant to be around. I, I did another story about Gary. Let's not keep on talking about him because we'll be here all day. But when Gary was a pop star, he was very lonely. 
And as you may know, he is he is on the autistic spectrum. He finds it difficult to communicate, and that people in the press found that he was difficult. They didn't like him. He wasn't immediately likable. That's because he was nervous and he was shy and he was autistic, and he found it all all a bit crazy. But what he used to do is he used to write to other pop stars. So if a pop star suddenly became famous, he would write a letter to them back in the olden days, an actual letter, and pop it in the post box and say, hello, I'm Gary. Would you like to be my friend? Um, and apparently one of the people that responded was Adam Ant. Oh, wow. And Adam Ant actually came to meet him and met him in the studio and, and they, they became friends. But it was one of those things where there's something sweetly beautiful about being this Gary Newman character, this kind of android, this robot, and then writing a note to people and saying, hello, it's a bit weird being a pop star. Would you like to be my mate? And I think that's, that's a lovely thing. I think that does him a lot of credit. I think that's... You know, what a nice guy. I think it's beautiful, actually. That, 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 that's, that's, that's brilliant to actually reach out. You know, because... Yes. It's, 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 um, I think that's what people should do. You know, I, know, I know they're taking... Because um, it's one thing typing something and hitting the send button, but there's actually a proactive effort, effort to handwriting something, which when you're charging it with your energy anyway, and then you're, then you're going through the procedure of mailing it and, and putting it there, so you're directing the energy. So I, I think that's... There is something special about it, I agree. And it, it's, it's just that nice idea of, of, of being in a position where people think you're this big pop star, and the thought of him just writing a little note and posting it in the little red letterbox, I, I, I find kind of beautiful. And, and maybe it's one of the reasons why Gary's still going. Gary's still making magnificent music oh, yeah. um, all these years on. Yeah. And I think maybe he's living proof that you can be a nice guy and you can, you can do something wonderful and still be a nice guy and still be yourself, which is kind of what we all want, isn't it? I don't want to turn into a monster. A synth monster. <laughs> it's a, do you know what yeah. it's one of those things where obviously i'm sitting here i'm dressed up it's the middle of the afternoon i'm dressed like an astronaut well i mean it, it's it's absolutely crazy but this is a performance yes it is. i'm on stage therefore i have the whole astronaut suit on you know I'm, I'm sitting here you can only see me from here i could be sitting here in my boxer shorts i'm not i'm sitting in a full astronaut suit Badass. because i'm performing i'm on stage but when this interview's over I'll take all this off, I'll pop down the co-op, I'll buy something for tea, and I'm just me again. I'm not performing, I'm not, you know, on stage, I'm demo devotion. On stage, I'm unstoppable. I am a god of synth pop. Yeah. And then I come off stage and I get changed, and I'm just the same quiet guy that I was before I went on stage. And that's, that's kind of wonderful to have that power. I think when stars real lives and personal lives bleed into each other that's when the craziness starts when they start believing the hype when they start it, well initially they live the dream then it becomes a nightmare and we've we've heard of so many pop stars who take to drink and drugs and, and fall off and, and god bless them some of them die and you just think what, what a way to go you know you were such a talent and such a, a free spirit and somehow the music industry has turned you into something that you were never meant to be. Exactly. And, and, and that makes me sad. But, but you're lucky because you've got Animal Pharmacy and you've got, they, they, work, they work with you, they, 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 they gel with you, so you're blessed in that regard. So, you know. We are, we are. But we also have, have our wives who are very, very good at keeping our feet on the ground. Brilliant. So whenever we get a little bit too carried away with ourselves, uh, there's always a bin to be emptied or a um, car to be washed, isn't there? And I think it's it's important, you know, no matter how much money rolls in and, and you know, if you end up, for gosh, imagine living in a big mansion with staff and things. I think it does you good every now and again to get down on your hands and knees and clean a toilet with a toilet brush. Yeah. Um, be a human. Yeah, damn right. Be, be real. I think as a younger man, um, I worked for the ultra high net worth individuals in London. Gosh. I detached myself from monetary stuff and I realised what do I really want to do? So I'm, I'm stuck on my own in the mansion now for months. Yes. And um, I'm not going to say any names to get myself in trouble. But, okay. But, but the thing is, I realised I love music and I thought, I want my own radio show. I thought, you know. I'd, I'd, I'd love to do that and that was, that was my goal so I, I pulled the shifts and the way we worked and to be grounded so to actually be washing the car to clean the loo with a flipping toothbrush or whatever you're going to do yes you know you have to go through that 
you know, you, you have to. It's important. Yeah, it is. It, 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 definitely, definitely. It, it's important. One of the first things that happened when my wife and I got together yeah. was she realised that I would DJ for nine months of the year, mm. and then for three months I'd just run up a load of debts. And she said, you know what, if you spent the summer working, then you would start off with money in the bank, you'd be able to promote the club nights better, and it had never occurred to me. And our job, believe it or not, was we were the toilet attendants at Headingley Cricket Ground. Badass. That's what we did for six weeks, eight weeks, however long it was. Did it though. And that was the point I knew I had to marry this girl because I'd never cleaned my own toilet, let alone a public toilet. And here I was with the woman that I loved doing something I never imagined I would do. But what I did learn, Dav, yeah. was that from that point I could always earn a living and I wasn't too good to get my hands dirty. And that's important. Damn. Sometimes you've got to do what you've got to do. And if it's cleaning a toilet for minimum wage, fantastic because it meant i went into the next year i had money in the bank i had my club nights without worrying about the first three months paying off all the debts i'd run up the previous three months and it was an absolute turning point in my life i had to marry her you know she's the brains of the operation you had to marry her i love that if she's if she, <laughs> she'll watch it later or whatever and she, she'll think wow 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 um right so have you ever lost motivation or hit a hurdle? Cause it, you know, you, you seem to be a very a driven individual. Both of you, are you and Timmy? Yeah, we absolutely are. Certainly when it comes to non-stop erotic cabaret and the creative process, we are very driven. But part of that is the fact that we have had setbacks, we have had hurdles, and we know what the downside of this is. We know that there are times when money won't be coming in, um, you know, COVID has been been devastating in terms of musicians and DJs and all the things that we would do yeah. that we cannot do anymore. But we're lucky that we have supportive partners who understand that and understand that after the hard times come the good times. But because it's always been feast and famine for us, we've either had loads or nothing at all. Wow. Um, and this is when, when we talk about um, equipment in a little while, yeah. most of what we've had has gone. Because we've hit times when you need to put food on the table, you need to pay the gas bill, yeah. and that synthesizer covered in dust, do you really need that? Or do you need the space and do you need the money? And that's a matter of priorities. Again, it's, it's about the thing, your head can be in the clouds, but you have to have your feet on the ground. Sometimes you've got to make difficult decisions, and sometimes you've got to think, no, actually the practical thing to do is, is to, to sell my synth or sell my guitar, um, because that's what you have to do. And it's, but what it does do, Dad, is it gives you an appreciation of the good times. And we are worldwide living in a terrible time. And yet somehow Timmy and I have made a positive out of it. We've taken a difficult time. We've taken the extra time that it's allowed us. Yeah. And we've done something positive with it. We've created something new out of nothing. And that's kind of beautiful, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a pleasure. But I don't think if you never had down times, you could never have up times. Life would just be a flat line. Yeah, it's true. It's, 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 it's very true. Um, I, you know, when I pick stuff up secondhand for the studio and all, I also know that where someone's heart was attached to something, there's an energy attached to something. And if someone's selling something out of sadness, you know, I, I, I'd rather... I'd rather not, uh, not, not not buy it or anything, but it's, it's not, not even just that. It's, it's just uh, that's, that. Maybe that sounds a bit weird, but um... no, I, I understand it. It's about um, instruments having a spirit, oh, yeah. and it's one of those things that that if you talk to, to a guitar person about guitars, mm. and you're like, oh, I got a '69 Gibson Les Paul, and it was once played by so and so. And the guitar people absolutely believe that there is some kind of spirit, some kind of wonderful energy that comes from owning uh, Jimi Hendrix's Stratocaster. Yeah. Yeah. But people mistake synthesizers for being just cold piece of electronics, and they're not, because they're imbued with the spirit of who's used them. And in terms of the equipment that has gone from myself and Timmy into the second-hand shop or onto eBay, it's actually a positive thing. It's a positive move. Instead of sitting worrying about a bill coming in, yeah. it's a positive thing. I'm making a positive statement that my family is more important than a piece of kit. Yeah. 
So if you bought something that belonged to us, it's got a positive spirit to it because we're doing a good thing. We might be a little bit sad yeah. that we've no longer got that DX7. Yeah. But on the other hand, we made it through another few weeks, another few months based on the money that the DX7 raised. So, you know, it's not necessarily a, a negative thing because it's in a, in a pawn shop or it's on eBay. Yeah. It can be very positive. Oh, wow. Um, but if you play it, if you get it and you feel it and it just doesn't feel right, then it's not right. True. Very, very, very true. Very true. So um, you brought us onto, onto, um, onto gear. Now, uh, what is what would he say is your on your hit list as the next acquisition for the studio? Oh my goodness me! So, this is something that I know that you know the, one of the things that that uh, the label has said to us over the years is, is we'd like you to be more controversial. We'd like you to be more, you know, uh, create a kind of bit of a storm about things. And I, I, I'm here to tell you that almost everything you hear on our tracks is virtual rather than hardware-based. Now, I can, I can see your smile has disappeared. No, no, it's not like that. So, so up until this point, Shocking. you were believing that we were sitting surrounded like Emerson, Lake and Palmer with banks of keyboards. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was thinking, yeah. Because you cannot tell the difference until somebody tells you that's not a Juno 6. You don't know, particularly when it's in a mix and when there's a vocal over the top and there's effects and stuff. Yeah. And the reason was we went from a standing start. Yeah. So most of the equipment has gone. And we've still got a couple of bits of old school kit that I'll tell you about. Yeah. But we went from nothing. We went from, from you know, perhaps we won't make any more music to suddenly we're making music every day. Um, and so the virtual. And that's when you said earlier on, you said about the idea of, of, of um, are you very choosy with your sounds? And we are. And then it's not just the sound that comes out of the synth, it's a tweet sound that comes out of the virtual synth that then goes through things like the Vitaminic processor to, to sonically enhance it. So we're very picky about it. Yeah. But we're also not stuck on the idea that we must have hardware. And you, you mentioned the word acquisition. Yeah. Uh, we have acquired an awful lot over the years, most of which has gone on to other people, and hopefully they're having fun and excitement with it. But yes. we started out this project saying we're not going to acquire things until we need them. And when we are going to acquire them, we will acquire them by borrowing them. We will acquire them um, cheap off eBay or in a pawn shop or wherever else we can find them, rather than going out and say, right, here's £10,000, let's go and buy a keyboard. Um, because... It, it's, it's limiting. And one of the things, I know you're a big fan of vintage gear and I don't want to upset you and your listeners, <laughs> but yeah. vintage equipment, um, it does what it does yeah. and it does it really well, but there is always another piece of equipment you need. Yeah, there is. So, yeah. so you buy a synth and it does fantastic bass sounds. Yeah. So you buy a Moog synthesizer and you get this sound out of it and you think, wow, that's amazing. But what I need now is something with a great string sound. So you buy another big black box with keys on. <laughs> um, and do you know what? It's great, but I'm not really into ambient music. What I want is to make dance music. I need a particular drum machine. I need that lovely uh, Roland thing that makes the acid sounds. I need one of those as well now. And before you know it, you're literally, you're thousands and thousands of pounds in. Yeah. And I'm looking behind you and going, yep, yeah, there's a man that's thousands and thousands of pounds in. And you never learn to get to the limits of your equipment that's right so you have so much and the shiny box syndrome kicks in and i've got this new thing and so everything for the next six weeks is going to sound like this new thing that i'm pressing um and then you kind of think oh, i don't really want to use that new thing anymore so i tell you what I, I know i'll sell it but you don't sell it do you You put it in its box or you put it on a shelf or you put it in a cupboard and you think i'll, I'll use that later um and, and sometimes you do and sometimes you don't whereas if you work completely virtually yeah. um, at least in the initial stages as Timmy does yeah. it's a matter of clicking on another synth you know here's another synth sound here's another synth sound I need a string sound bit of a Google what's the best right we'll, we'll download that and we'll use that yeah. but it's what happens to it after that so once the track comes to me and I put some vocals on and send it back to Timmy he then sends me all the waves yeah. and I take it apart and rebuild it 
and I add my sonic garnish, and that might be from samples or it might be from um, effects. It might be from I do have a piece of kit here, a, a Korg M50, which is sitting. So my my iPad is sitting on my Korg M50, um, and it's a classic piece. It's a classic piece of kit, and it, it almost. You could do almost anything. You can do everything with it because it is tweakable and it is has wonderful sounds in it, but you can also change those sounds and you can add effects to it. Dude. And that's great. Dude, dude, dude. Check this. But it's the layer on top. Check this. It's the layer on top. Go on. What have you got? Have you got one down? No. Yeah. <laughs> You know I mean? See, but that's yeah. I'm, I'm looking here I'm, I'm bewildered by the array of hardware that you have here Dave. There's, there's, so, there's so much and there's literally on my desk yeah. there is the m50 which is a permanently wired into my system yeah. and that's my one keyboard that does everything but what i can't manage without and what i wouldn't manage without in this project yeah. um, and it's going to sound like an advert and it isn't because i bought this yeah. is a tc helicon voice tone synth so all of the voice sounds yes yeah. that's me through this little piece of kit through this little box on my desk yeah and again it's one of those things that keeps on giving in my head i know what sound i'm looking for yeah with my fingers i can twiddle the knobs and get the sound i'm looking for so connected you'll see is a very different vocal sound yeah. to uh, mr moogie yeah. for example and it's that idea of i have or I had many years' experience singing in things like school choirs. Yeah. Um, so I have a very um, tuneful mm. voice. I can sing in tune, I can sing in time, but it's very pure. Yeah. It's very, there's nothing to it. There's very little character. If I want something that sounds a little more contemporary, that sounds a little more exciting, in comes the voice tone synth. And uh, I actually record vocals live through that. So rather than put on effects afterwards, it's one of those pieces of outboard gear that I literally will get the sound that I want and sing through it so it can't be undone in the track. So I'm not adding things to the voice in the track. What I'm doing is I'm using the voice tone sound to shape what the vocal's going to be. Wow. And I can already hear by that point where it needs to be, whether it needs to be a nice thin vocal with a telephone megaphone thing going on, or is it a nice softly spoken vocal? Is it a quiet vocal? Wow. And I dial those sounds in and then I use them throughout the track, which gives you a kind of layer of consistency. Um, so having said everything's uh, virtual, everything's virtual for me, apart from the M50 and the TC Helicon. But, um, you know, it's just that thing that gives you that sound. And perhaps in 20 years' time, people like yourself yeah. will be paying thousands of pounds for a piece of kit because you go, I want the non-stop erotic cabaret vocal sound. Um, and you can only buy them vintage, and I'll pay two grand for something that cost, I don't know, £100, £150. Um, and you will be able to dial that sound in. And that's the attraction of classic gear. I want to sound like such and such. This is what they used. And now I sound like them. But when are you going to sound like yourself? Wow. Good point. Valid. What a point. What a point. When are you going to sound like yourself? When are you going to sound like yourself? Basically, you pimp slapped me. <laughs> <laughs> that was never my intention. Though. I told you this was, the label said, be more controversial. I'm being controversial. Yeah. This, is, this is, but I'm also being true to you. Yeah. This is how we create things. I could lie to you. Yeah. I could tell you we have Vince Clark's studio at our disposal. We do not. We have an iPad. We have creativity. We have vision. We have an M50 and a voice tone synth. And you've heard the results. Dude, you're badass. What's that saying? <laughs> it's saying you don't need loads of gear to produce a banger. So uh, you can spend an absolute fortune and produce utter rubbish. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And I think talking about sounding like yourself, hmm. what is it that makes you happy? It's a very deep and meaningful question. But musically, Dav, what makes you happy? I'll be honest with you. Want to hear a synth? <laughs> <I'll be Right. laughs> So you've decided on the genre of music. Mm. You love synths. You love the way they sound, the way they feel. So you're going to do synth music. Yeah. What kind of synth music makes you happy? I, I made my own little genre in my in my, in my day. Um, when, you know, now that yeah. is pleasing yourself. Yeah. That is doing what you should be doing. You're writing something. You're creating something that gives you pleasure and satisfaction. If anybody else likes it, it's kind of by the by. 
Yeah. But you are making yourself happy by creating your kind of music. And the fact that you've said, oh, it's kind of my own genre, well, that's perfect. That's the genre you should be pursuing. That's the DAV genre, where people go, oh, yes, proper DAV tune. And you go, what do you mean? Well, it's a genre that came out of London um, from this this, uh, this synthesizer guy 20 years ago. It was amazing. You've got to get this piece of kit that he used because, you know, the DAV scene is where it's at. That's what you want to hear, right? Oh, yeah, but for, for me, I, I, I sidetracked into in, into radio, see, years ago. And uh, But what it is, my heart's still in, in synthesizer, so as soon as I come across you guys i thought right i need to <laughs> i thought right this is it because i thought it touches my heart um yes so, so you're uh but you what do you make up the whole like I, I really think the rolling cloud is amazing you know have you tried out the, 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 their stuff no and it's a deliberate avoidance just as i tend to avoid modern music i yeah. tend to avoid modern gear because i was that guy who would always be wanting the next piece of kit, who would always be wanting to try things. Yeah. And I honestly don't think, even you know, 30 tracks in, I don't think we have fully exploited what we have. But mm. we get to a point where the inspiration dries up. We get to a point where we're starting to feel bored by our own music. True. We have a choice. We can either stop making it or we can start making something else. And if that something else requires us to have... A new piece of uh, new piece of kit. Then we have to invest in it, don't we? Do you know um, with with me? Um, I'll, I was going to ask you. Uh, you know, I think you've already answered the question because I'm re I'm really excited about Behringer's um, version on the ARP twenty six hundred. Now, yes and you know that, that's 555 euros yeah coming out gosh soon. but um, and that's the, and that's the cheap version right yeah 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so I, 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 I just figured that uh, i have space in the studio for that but what i did in preparation uh for for this acquisition is um i commissioned um a power supply builder to build me a linear power supply Wow. Uh, yes, yeah, so Mr. Mr. Baldwin. Um, so I've got this lovely power supply built there. So what I'm doing, I'm experimenting. So not with not lots of money. I'm basically um, I found this way where you can patch into a sound card and drop the noise floor by using a linear power supply, thereby increasing the headroom. There's that and then fantastic. It, it is cool, but but I know that the uh, I think that one the the, the new Behringer, which you may call it the twenty six hundred ARP thing, uh, requires twelve volts at two amps. So twelve Gosh. volts at two amps, rather than you know from a a budget uh, wall wart, but yes, we've got some you know handmade custom linear regulated thing. So I've been experimenting over the past few. And, oh, and I've also been soldering as well. I, I saw, you know, to save money, I sold my own, my own, my own gear. So I've, I've built a, a fantastic. Nah, nah. It's because when you, when you, don't, you don't, I don't have as much money as I did ten years ago. But um, who does? Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's true. It's true. But you know, this, this is how it gets started. Yeah. So Timmy actually builds his own synthesizers, and if you look on our Instagram, you can see one of his synthesizers. Talk to me about it's it. absolutely nuts. It, it, it's, it starts out life as a cardboard box and ends up as a synth. Mind-blowing. But it starts out with you going, well, I can wire a plug. It's a bit like the advert. I can wire a plug, then I can make this. If I can make this, I can make that. Oh, I can build my own synthesis. And he does. And, you know, I think that's a much more um, honest and creative way to create a new sound. I want a new sound. I'll build a thing that does it. And, you know, Timmy really is a, a, a kind of... A, quiet genius about those sorts of things wow. um and he would absolutely hate to talk about it with you because he, he's just so incredibly modest um but, you know he's, he's in a very gifted guy and what i think you talk about this new piece of equipment you've got space for it you mean physical space have you got mental space and space in your heart for this piece of gear good point Quick. Is it going to slow down your creative process? Is it going to inspire you? Is it going to take you to the next level? Are we going to create a dab scene that will take over the world, make <laughs> the world a better place? Or yeah. is it just something else to dust come the weekend? That's that's my question to you. Good question. Good question. With, with, me, uh, with me, personally, I don't have the level of talent in terms of music as you do. I'm more radio, but um, on my downtime, I, I, um, I always... 
I think a lot. I, th I think a lot about signal chains, and I, uh, I think about how can I improve the gear I have. And you know, I'm not brilliant with a soldering iron, but um, I, uh, I've, I've put together one thing. I always wanted to do was put together my own transformer box. Right. Yeah, with just just transformers, you know. So I'd I'd contact uh, Carn Hill or you know. Or, Sauter and you know I, I I think right so let's run this through through here and and and, I, and as soon as I I heard you know twenty years ago I heard the sound of an old Midas console and, right and yes one yes, of yes. My dreams was to own one so I've got one uh, over there well, 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 it's, it's it's over there yeah the, 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 it's over one side or the other yeah, it's yeah, there yeah. somewhere yeah yeah so um to to to, to, to run through that. But uh, I'm I'm specialising more it just just radio sonics uh, mixing. You know, I'm a big fan of Mike Senior. I really uh, work through his um, his his tutorials. I trained on an old uh, duality, but for me, um, uh, music production was a very very lonely uh, uh, period in my life, and that's the reason why I got into radio was because I wanted to be around other musicians yes. and I want them to to connect you know it was really important so. I, I, and i totally get that it, it can be a very lonely thing and, and certainly um it wasn't as if before timmy came back into my life that i wasn't creating music and i was creating a lot of a lot like, funny enough a bit like gary newman's newer stuff a kind of dystopian nine inch nails gary newman bleak end of the world feeling sorry for myself yeah and when i listened back to it Part of that was the fact that I was on my own. I was doing it on my own. And although Timmy and I are not in the same physical location when we're working, he's always there. He's always there in my mind. Or I get a message, comes through on the WhatsApp. Um, oh, have you thought about doing such and such? So it's, it's a collaborative process. And I think what I've learned is that when we collaborate, we produce something that is far exceeds what we've been able to do on our own. Wow. So maybe what you need, Dav, is a partner in crime, yeah. with or without a helmet and a mask, <laughs> to, uh, to be Robin to your Batman yeah. um, and, and, and to kind of take things to the next level. Because that, that really is a joy, and that makes it much more of a social thing rather than an antisocial thing. Yeah. Um, and to, to both create something that you both like, you've instantly you have doubled your audience because you both listen to it. Oh, brilliant. But the, the, you know? That is absolutely brilliant. That's a very valid point. It's just um, with me, unfortunately, like, the radio takes a lot of my time. Like the radio, like, there's a lot of stuff behind the scenes. With, you know, the, the tech of course. stuff, and it just it just it kills you off. And then, then then the fun part is like today I went walking, walked four miles yes. out. There's a couple of lakes at the back of the studio over here. Walk around the oh, lakes. Wonderful. It, it it is lovely. And I thought, look how lucky I am. I thought I'm doing my own radio show. You know, I'm, I'm interviewing Demo. And I thought, this is badass. The, 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 yes. You know, what you visualise, <laughs> you, you can realise. You know, yes. it's about visualising it and where someone's trying to suppress your ability to visualise yes. and, and keep you uh, mentally busy or sidetracked, you'll never realise. So, You're absolutely right. When, the difficult thing is finding out what it is that you want to do. Yeah. And it's not just about money. It's not just about happiness. It's about fulfillment. Oh, very what is the thing that will fill my life? It could be difficult to do. It could be easy to do. But it's something that takes you on that kind of spiritual journey towards nirvana, if you want to get all holy about it. It's that thing that takes you towards self-actualization. Yes. That thing or those things that you do that just take you into a place where you're more serene. And that positive energy then spreads out with the people around you. So it's 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 uh, it's not an entirely selfish act because if you become this person who is at ease with themselves, you will find other people are drawn to you, and you can positively affect their lives simply by being around them. Right. Simply by somebody contacts you and, and joins your SoundCloud page, um, take the time to have a listen to some of their tracks, leave some feedback, say, do you know what, this is great, even if you think. I know what I would change about it. That's not what they want to hear. They want to hear, you know, there's some kid in the bedroom, you know, just experimenting with that. It's the first ever tune. They don't need to be destroyed by somebody going, well, have you thought about using sonic enhancers? And I think the bass end needs a little bit of tightening up. They don't want that. They want you to go, do you know what? This is great. Go for it. If this makes you happy, 
do it, do it, do it. And I think sometimes you were talking about not appreciating sometimes how lucky we are. Yeah. And it's important. It's important to look around. You know, we are very, very fortunate. You know, we're both sitting in rooms surrounded by things, things which some people could only dream of having. We have creativity. We have a positivity and an energy, and we have things that we do that we love. We're not cleaning toilets. Yeah. And for some people, that's a stopgap. For some people, that's their life. And if they're happy with it and they're good with it, then fair play to them. Yeah. Go for it. But if it's making them unhappy, if it's stopping them from being creative, from living whatever dream they had, yeah. then that's a shame. And I think we need to support people more in the community. Um, I was talking to somebody yesterday who'd created a playlist yeah. on um, Spotify. So 50 artists on a playlist. Yeah. And only six of them listened to the playlist. So how does that make any sense? That's mad. You could support every one of those artists for free by playing the entire playlist at least once. Do them the courtesy of playing it once. Yeah. So everybody gets an extra Spotify play. Yeah. yeah. But to be on a playlist that somebody's taken the time to curate and not share the love seems absolutely crazy to me. And I wrote about it on Twitter. I said, is it weird that nobody's doing this? And I got some very positive responses. But of course, they were from the people that had listened, the people that had liked all the tracks on there. You know, we have an opportunity with Spotify. People say a lot of bad stuff about Spotify. But there is an opportunity to create a musical utopia where talent can rise to the top. But it cannot rise to the top. It cannot trigger the magic algorithm unless everybody supports everybody else that's true instead of listening to um i don't want to pick on billy eilish but instead of picking on billy eilish it just instead of listening to what's in the chart yeah. take some time to listen to somebody else like it uh, maybe send it to your friends and go do you know i heard this new track this is great and also supporting your fellow artists and we live in a system that has put us in competition with each other and that's what the charts are all about. It's a competition to get to number one in the charts. It's not good. It's not good. It's not good and it's not healthy. And it's, it's not, not no. it's not really what what does it mean in the end? Being being having a number one single. Exactly. What does it mean? It's 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 meaningless. Exactly. Do you, 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 you know for um regarding competitiveness we can I can even take it to uh, as a radio presenter, you know, because of lockdown I've had like over a hundred songs a week sent over to me, right? And I listen to every one of them. Wow, you know, it's, it's it's mad. And you know, I'm not exactly the BBC. I'm not a, I'm not, I'm not a big time guy, um, big time presenter or anything. But even though last year, anyway. But the the, the thing is, I um, the loudness wars. Now that's one thing that that, that gets <laughs> on my cup. Yeah, I, I I hate stuff which is mastered and you know put against a brick wall limiter. And yep. you know you, you hear it, and it, it's fatiguing on the air, and you know I don't want to play it out on my show. So um, I, you know, regarding comp competition and to get to number one, and I think that's a tactic that a lot of uh, producers or, or engineers use. I think for me, I, I go the other way. I, I'm all about great dynamics. Um, yes. In, in music, so regarding the. Uh, the mix decisions and mastering decisions between you and Timmy. Can you talk about that? I absolutely can talk about that. And, and I completely remove those decisions from Timmy. <laughs> so once he send, sends me the tune and I send him it back with a vocal and he goes, yeah, it's all right, that. go for it. Why don't yeah. you try this? Or have you thought about a different mid light? Yeah. He then sends me the waves and that's it. That's it. I take it apart. I change it around and I do all the mixing and the mastering um, because I have the equipment and the experience to do that. Yeah. It's one of the wonderful things about working with a compatible partner. So I've had musical partners in the past that we would fight all the time about everything. It's the bass sound, it's the strings. Everything is, is just a battle. Yeah. Um, Timmy is not like that. He's a wonderfully gracious partner. And so to then send him um a a finished because they never finished but send him <laughs> send him something send him a finished mix yeah. and for him to go that's really good but what about such and such and so then i'll go back and i'll do another mix and yeah, have you thought about so and so so it's a very gentle i think in many ways a very british and polite way of doing it yeah. so for example i really like the vocal on the chorus 
actually means I'm not sure about the verses. Ah. The verse and the chorus vocals are really strong means middle eight needs a bit of work. <laughs> and because we've known each other for, we've known each other for so long, we kind of we have this way of going on. It's all very polite and it's all very positive. And it's not because we're not passionate, we don't care. We both want the track to be as good as it can be. Are as good as we can make it. Yeah. But there is that kind of toing and froing. So it's not a case of me taking it and sending it again. That's it. It's done. Because what Timmy likes to do, he goes out and walks on the moors. So we live right up in the Pennine Hills of Yorkshire, surrounded by trees and sheep and hills, and it's absolutely stunning. Wow. And whereas I stay in the house all day, mixing and remixing tracks, Timmy puts the music on his his um, phone, and he goes out walking on the moors. So time and time again, when we get metrics for where your fan, your biggest fans are, yes, it should literally say Timmy's house, because he's listening again and again to those tracks, and all the time he's thinking about how how this can be improved, how this can be changed. He told me last week, you love this, yeah. Um, we were talking about a particular track, and he went, you know, that's the one, the only one I always skip when I'm out walking. Twenty four hours later, we had a complete new remix of it. So I couldn't bear the thought that our biggest fan didn't like what I'd done to his track. He liked it when it left him. He didn't like it when it left me. So I did a complete new thing. I did a complete radical new mix um, with new beats and new bass lines and new synths. Um, that's the one I was talking about. I put string parts on it. I'm like, well, I, I'm, that's it. I'm going to show him now. This is, this is a great track and this is how it should sound. And I sent it to him and I just got a message back and it was just the, uh, the cool emoji, the guy with the glasses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like, that's it. It's a thumbs up. I, I don't because the thought that our biggest fan was skipping past a track that will not stand. And that was another all nighter. I have to say that was uh, that was another late night, early morning. Look, the sun's coming up. Well, I can, my wife's going to work. I can see her out the window. <laughs> um, but it, but it was worth it because if we can't please each other, then what's the point? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but and it was fun. Wow. Uh, can I ask you a question about um, doors? In other words, uh, digital audio workstation. So, what, what do you what do you work? In? <laughs> you already know what it means, but so I do because the, you know I, I, this is another controversial thing I'm going to say to you right now. So, oh. uh, Timmy works in Garage Band. Okay, that's cool. Um, in fact, his the first tune he sent to me was just an experiment. I wonder how Garage Band works. I've got this thing on my iPad, and and that was the first tune that he sent to me. I work using dun, 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 Acid Pro. Oh my God! You've taken me back yes. twenty years. Twenty years. Yes. Oh my God! So, Acid Pro was the only door I could afford back in the day, um, and I seem to remember it was little more than a child's toy when it started out. Yeah. Um, but it got better and better, and it got to the point with with Acid Pro. Yeah where it was basically invisible to me in terms of the creative process. I do not have to think. Hmm. If I want to lay down on the vocal track or I want to put on some guitar or I want to put some, I don't have to think about it. Whereas if I if I updated and went for Pro Tools, which I know you've been relearning recently, yeah. Um, yeah. sonically, I don't think you'd hear the difference. Yeah. Apart from in the background, there would be a low-level grumbling and swearing from me going, stupid thing. Why does it do so? <laughs> How does that happen? There'd be just a constant whinging in the background of, of me just complaining why it didn't do... Why doesn't Acid used to do that. Why doesn't it do that? So, like a lot of producers, um, my door is stuck in the past. Yeah. I don't know if you've ever seen Fat Boy's Slim set up. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, it's basically using an Akai sampler and a Commodore 64 or something crazy. Yeah. Even I thought that was old school. You know, I'm, I'm running a, a state-of-the-art PC, yeah. but I'm running a piece of software that I don't know when the last update was. I don't even if they have updated it. Dude. But um, but it works for me. And I think it's, it's the same we're talking about the analog equipment. If it works for you and you love it and you love the results that come out of it, yeah. then keep it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The missing part of the, the jigsaw is the keyboard I can see behind there in the corner. Yeah, that can go. You don't use that. That can <laughs> yeah, go. In fact, <laughs> you want the new Ber you want the new Behringer, make a sacrifice, trade in that keyboard with a dealer to get a discount on, on your Behringer. Behringer. Bye -bye. You'll enjoy it you'll enjoy it more, Dav. 
It's true. It's 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 it, it, it's so true. Do you know? Um, I I personally bloody are we talking? Are we talking about Sonic Foundry's acid? Yeah. Yes, we are. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. In the green box. Yeah, man. I think it was the only it was the only door that I could afford. Yeah. The actual software. So I'd had demos. I'd had. Um, don't tell anybody cracked software um, as we all did when we we'll started it, yeah. out because yeah. Yeah. it's a huge investment yeah. and what piece of software is out there that I can afford that is legit where I actually get the code and I don't have to go to some weird website to get a code for it Yeah. what can I afford that I think will do the job and that's where Acid came in because it was oh, literally hundreds of pounds cheaper than Cubase or Pro Tools or any of those other big names. I'm not sure Acid would get into the top 10 of doors that people are using today, but it works. Dude, You've it does heard work. the results, Stav. You love it. You've heard the results. <laughs> you know, this is this is the whole thing that we're saying about, about um, hardware synthesizers and the latest Pro Tools version that costs goodness knows how many hundreds, if not thousands of pounds. Yeah. Can you hear it when you're in the car? Can you hear it when you're on your iPod or your iPhone with your little earbuds in? You can't hear the difference. And certainly Timmy and I can't because we spent so much time around loud music. We're lucky if we can hear the doorbell these days, uh, let alone anything else. Can I ask um, a question? You've got this really powerful PC, like you said, yeah, you've got a high, yeah. high spec PC. Tell me yeah. more about the high spec PC. It is an Omen computer. What's an Omen? From HP. Okay. okay. An Omen. Because, of course, growing up being called Damien. Ah. Um, <laughs> So when I saw there was an Omen computer yeah. and I was in the market for a computer, I thought it would be rude of me not to have Damien the Omen computer. In fact, I have a signed photo from the Omen movie on my wall of my studio of, of the little boy in the graveyard. Get lost. Um, because I mean, it was a here. big... <laughs> it's what? I said, get lost. <laughs> Are you kidding? Well, no, it's, it's, just, it's just here on the wall behind me, Damien the Omen. Um my because it's it's it has been a part of my life, albeit tangentially. The amount of times over the years that people said, "Have you got six 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 written in your head?" I even considered having it tattooed at one point. So my answer could be yes. I am the son of Satan with an Omen PC and six 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 on my head. <laughs> I'm not. I'm deadly frightened of needles and pain in general. But it's one of those things that somehow it became part of my life um so an omen pc it was a no-brainer i had to have one and that was a, a birthday present from my wife carrying on the tradition of my parents so every present every gift every birthday every christmas yes has been as long as i can remember has been musical instruments musical equipment my parents is there anything you need yes and if it was a no, so right, is there anything you want? Yes. So that's how I ended up with a full-size white double bass, which is in the corner of my living room, because I went, oh, I don't know. A big white double bass, and they went, fantastic. And so I arrived at Christmas at their house, and there was the most enormous box um, with a bow on it, because they couldn't wrap it, because it was just too big. And, and so I have a, a big white double bass, because they approved, because they went, yes, we will support you in this crazy notion that you want to learn how to play a double bass. And they did. And I did learn how to play it. Um, but that's, that's, that's a wonderful thing. Like you said, we talked right at the top of the interview about are your family supportive? Mm. And yes, but not always in the ways that you think. So sometimes just allowing you the freedom is supportive. So my wife is not actively supportive. She doesn't come to see us play live. She doesn't come to, to, to see us DJ. But she allows me to have the time to do that. Very you know, that, and that's wonderful. That's a really supportive kind of in the background kind of thing. And I couldn't have had the freedom that I've had without her giving me that permission. So Damo, is, is Damo yes, short? Right. Is, is, it, is it Damon or Damien? It's short for Damien. Oh my god! I've got a son called Damon. I have a son called Damon. Oh really? Okay. Yeah, yeah. But but. The... So we we were Brookside fan by any chance? <laughs> do you know what it is? It's because I, I I do a lot of reading and research. Like uh, I think you gathered that in, in my downtime. Uh, what it is? The Damons um, on the astral plane. They when the the woman is pregnant, carrying a child, they'd come around and. Uh, they would be in charge or they would determine the work or you know 
that the, 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 the child would do their attributes or professions. So that that would be the, the daemon, D-A-E-M-O-N. So, so like a good parent, you're thinking of, of a career right from birth. You're thinking <laughs> this is what this is what you're going to do in the celestial body. You're going to be a daemon. You're going, uh, we're going to, to call you daemon so you can be a daemon. <laughs> See, following on by the same thing, I really should have become um, uh, one of Satan's acolytes. Um, thank goodness I didn't pursue that. Uh, <laughs> nah, did, that view, but, do you know, but that's beautiful. If anyone ever says to you about the whole six 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 thing, just <laughs> tell them six protons, six neutrons, six electrons equals carbon twelve. Just tell them that. <laughs> It's, it wouldn't be the weirdest thing I've said in response to it, so I'll, I'll take that one. Thank you. Bloody <laughs> um, <laughs> hell. So, um, okay, so, so you got a, a powerful computer. Like, with, with me, I've spent my whole weekend, right, um, I've got an old machine, right, and the, the reason why I buy Outboard is because I don't want to upgrade my machine. And that's what it is. Right. I've got an old... Um, early 2008 3.1 mac pro i've spent this whole weekend um, putting in 5870 rx what do you call it graphics card wow. in that thing. Uh, okay without flashing it uh, got myself a boot screen on it uh done that enabled radeon boost um you know in, in, in an old machine and uh, the reason my philosophy is I don't like wasting money. So what takes a lot of the resources in terms of your door? I, I just figured it's going to be processing and synthesizers off all outboard synthesizers. Take that load away. FX, yes. universal audio card or Lexicon MX200 unit. Done. Um, you know, um, uh, th that's what I'm all about. I, I do not want to... I even upgraded the processors in the old Mac Pro to 3.2s from 2.8s. So, so um, I'm I'm proper proper scroogey when it when it comes to when it comes to the, the computer itself, but uh, but it, it's just the fact that um, you've made very very valid points. You are producing amazing music, and you're working within within the software realm. You know, I I have a, an external Omega sound card that I realised I could buy a replacement for forty quid off eBay now. Tell me more about the Omega Sound Card, please. So it's it's an Omega Sound Card. It's a little blue box about this big. Yeah. Has all the knobs on the front. Has all of the channels and things on the back. Yeah. And it is like everything that I use. It's entirely adequate. Yeah. So there's there's no noise. It does what I need it to do. It will not allow me to record a live rock band because there's very few inputs to it. Yes. Because there's only me. I only need to play one instrument at a time. So it's got enough room for a guitar at the front, keyboard at the back, in stereo. So it's got enough inputs for me. Yes, yeah. It's silent. It doesn't affect the sound. The sound that I hear is the sound that comes through it. Beautiful. Good first. And it does what it needs to do, as opposed to me having something that does far more than I'll ever use. If it becomes a problem, if we get to a point where it's not good enough then it'll have to change. But again, I, I, I'm looking at it, it's going slightly yellow around the edges. I'm guessing five years, ten years, possibly, old right. piece of equipment. They still do drivers for it. I updated the drivers this week for it, and it does what it needs to do. It won't do any more. I, I think, I think, so would you say that that's, for your studio, that's one of the state, the, the, you know, the, the one of the cores of it is a stable uh, sound card with which still supported to this day you know uh, yes. which is which is your omega i need to research more into that i've got an old um and i mean old rme fireface 800 and um people say upgrade your sound card man i go no i go they're still supported to this day right yep the difference between the 800 and the, and the 802 the 802 may go higher in terms of, of, of frequency response, but right. it doesn't go as low. So when you start meddling with those low frequencies, that's yes. when the government, or in any case, if you start meddling, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's when you find yourself locked in a lab. Yeah, uh, yeah, making, yeah. Uh, making poodles poop remotely. I mean, it's. <laughs> but, it, but it's that thing of finding what works for you, and, and what works for you, yeah. it creates the sound that you want to create. Yeah. When you get to a point where you are limited by it, so your monitors 
don't quite cut it, or your sound card, or your PC, or your screen's not big enough, that's the time for me to upgrade. Well, it becomes a necessity. Yes. And funnily enough, these points of necessity always come around birthdays or Christmas. <laughs> and I'm lucky enough to have a summer birthday and Christmas. So I've got two chances in the year to go, actually, I what I'd this. really like, yeah. never mind a, a, a hat or some gloves, what I'd really like is... And my wife just says, oh, fine, buy it, wrap it, put it under the tree with my name on it. It's like, there we go. <laughs> That's the support again. Because she knows that I've got to the point where I need it. I don't just buy things for the heck of it. There was a period. I have a beautiful collection of vintage guitars to my right here. Okay. But I, I'm not going to show you for security purposes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. But I, I got into that gearhead notion where I would be better if only I had this, if only I had that. Yeah. If I had such and such, I'd be a better guitarist. I learned to my cost that it is not the case. But it gets to a certain point with guitars um, where they are good enough, and certainly good enough for the standard. Yeah. If you buy something that's too cheap, with a guitar in particular, yeah. um, it holds you back. Yeah. So if you, if you buy your your cheap the cheapest electric guitar that's in the Argos, there you go. Yeah, that's a great starter guitar. Yeah. But after you you started, you've learned your chords and things. You're moving on to solos, and you find that it's out of tune higher up the neck, and you can't alter the neck because the intonation is wrong on it. So it's great for hammering out your Oasis songs and your mates. Like, oh, you sound great. At some point, that guitar is no longer good enough. At some point, your Bon Tempe keyboard is no longer good enough. Yeah. Although I still do have a Yamaha DD20 drum machine that I play live. No way. With the four pads. Um, so whilst the, the track itself is playing away, yes. I'm adding percussion. A bit like Depeche Mode, I'm adding percussion in the background. Yes. Um, my big tip when you're playing a live drum machine, steer away from the bass drum. Don't try and play the bass drum, particularly for the, the bass drum. I've learned to my cost that you will make it sound worse if you have a bass drum on there. Really? Accents, fantastic. A nice ride ride um, cymbal, fantastic. Yeah. Something in a hand clap, wonderful. Just keep away from the bass drum because you're going to make the track sound a mess. Because there's always, wherever you're playing, there's always some kind of delay. So whether it's to do with the equipment yes. or the board or the speakers, the monitors, you're not quite in sync with the track even though you're on stage with it you're a little bit out so steer away from the bass drum that's a that's, i should have a t-shirt though that's a great piece of steer advice for anybody who wants to play like stay away from the bass drum play some percussion i mean if you remember depeche mode in the glory days playing big pieces of sheet metal on stage with sledgehammers yes fantastic i don't think for a minute that was real i don't think you could hear any of that stuff but it was theater it was performance and that really what i'm doing on the drum kit there is i'm performing because we have created i say we timmy has created a large interactive robot head i was going to ask you that question called well, Marvin, Marvin, when the vocals come out, yes. Marvin, the um, Marvin the Magnificent, um, the vocals come out of Marvin. So in the studio, it's me singing. Yeah. But there is so much work and so much processing goes into getting the vocal sounds. Yes. That I don't sing live. I can sing live, but it would sound like Alan Jones singing over non-stop erotic cabaret. It would be a choir boy's voice over the top. So what we have is Marvin, who stands between us, this beautiful robot yes. made out of, of pots and pans and things. And um, there is an iPad within Marvin where you see the waveform of the vocal. So Marvin is the singer when we play live. I have my little drum machine to do my little bit of theatre on one side. Timmy's on the other side doing all the electronic stuff. It's a beautiful thing to see. Um, and it's complete artifice. Very few artists you go see these days are actually playing on stage. And the reason is it's so difficult to replicate what you've created in the studio, what you've heard on the record in a live environment. Because sonically, it's come an awful long way since Bob Dylan got on stage on the acoustic guitar. Yeah, yeah. Although if you listen to Ed Sheeran, you might not think that's the case, but it is. Um, so what that allows us to do is the flexibility to remix tracks on the fly. Because there isn't a vocalist, a live vocalist, waiting for the vocal to come in. Have you ever seen the Happy Mondays perform live? Oh, wow. Mr. Ryder, Mr. Sean William Ryder, has no idea what's going on with the music. He comes in, he drops out, he, he goes... Every now and again, because <laughs> he's forgotten where he is. 
and it's kind of fun to watch yeah but i think unless they were on a festival bill you might be a bit annoyed that he can't remember his own songs um and we all know he was a big fan of the ice cream man um <laughs> in in his younger days um so <laughs> so we, we made a decision that, that i was not going to sing live that marvin was going to be our live singer Genius. and we would be effectively supporting marvin genius and it meant that we have complete control and a three four minute pop song can become a new order style 10 minute epic with ever looping bass drums and samples laid over the top and some drum machine going it's a different thing it's not a live rock band playing with guitar solos it's two electronic musicians performing with their best friend marvin the magnificent um and that's why we're in the space seats we've got a robot what more could you want? Why wouldn't you want to see that? that that's, a, that's a very valid point. You've actually covered one of the questions I was, was going to ask you. If you could build a robot, what would you program it to do? <laughs> <laughs> uh, sing live, absolutely. This is, this is the whole point of Marvin. Was um, I was presented with Marvin uh, yes. on one of my rare visits to, to Timmy's studio. I walked in and there was this monstrous uh, robot and I went, wow. And he went, it gets better. You put the music on and Marvin's mouth, you know, the, the waveforms are coming out of Marvin's mouth and Marvin is singing uh, with my voice. And I'm thinking, this is fantastic. This is absolutely. And so he's become an integral part of things. And it was literally Timmy being bored one afternoon in the studio. He had the materials, he had an idea and he went for it. And he's that kind of guy. That's why he's such a great partner to work with. I never know what he's going to come up with, you know? Um, but yes, to do the live vocals, it is extremely difficult. I have nothing but admiration for artists that can get out there in front of a live band and perform live vocals. But nine times out of ten, Dav, it's a lie. At best, they're singing over the top of their own record. Yeah. Sometimes they don't even turn the vocal down. So they're, they're karaokeing across the top of it. I'd rather be honest about it. Yeah, you exactly. know, I'm quite happy for people to know that it's me on the track. Yeah. But it might as well be Marvin singing it. You know, I could put on a headset, pretend I'm doing a doing a I don't know, a Madonna or Britney Spears, I could do that's not me. I'd rather be behind a drum machine, giving it loads of my drumsticks. Um <laughs> Love it, love it, love it, love it, love it, love it. But you've made a very a very valid point there. You know, um many people are you know they, they use it to as an effect as well the actual whole even auto tune thing and the, the ability to sing live in in the asian community it's like a um it's like a benchmark you know like you know right. basically can the guy sing live yeah and yes. many, many people have had their pants pulled down um on, on on stage about that you know regarding um can you can you sing live and uh, it's the dishonesty that upsets people yes yeah that's what it is if you come out and you say i'm going to play the record i'm going to dance around but i'm miming yeah. that's fine people get that you can't bring a live band with you maybe you're doing a a, a performance in a um in a weird setting they put the cd on you dance around you say hey how you doing everybody that's fine people get that and they accept that but if you're pretending that this is all coming out of you and then suddenly the track skips or the track stops and you can hear the actual voice or the piece of kit breaks down yeah, i make no bones about it the tc helicon voice tone synth available from all good retailers brilliant um is what happens to my voice after it leaves my mouth brilliant it goes in through the mic it comes out through that but it's not me it's not just me it's me with electronics and to do that in a live situation I'm not sure there's a point. You know, it's it's studio studio wizardry. And to try and replicate that, and Lord help us if they try to do a dance routine as well. How how could you possibly sing and dance at the same time? That's absolutely nuts. Which is why a lot of the biggest performers in the world yeah. they're not singing. The miming. Because they would have to have the the resting heart rate of an Olympic athlete to be able to sing and dance at the same time you know i think people like uh, neil tennant get it absolutely right if i'm going to sing i'm going to stand absolutely still because it's all i can do to stand absolutely still and sing it's quite an effort um but when they start doing dance routines i mean the k-pop stuff that's that's coming out of korea is oh, it's magnificent yes it's basically 
the Backstreet Boys from 20 years ago. Yes. But remarketed for a new generation. I totally get it. I love it. And they're beautiful and they're coordinated. I have suspicion some of them are actually created in virtual reality. I don't think they're actual people, let alone re real musicians. Wow. But what they do is wonderful. But they're wonderful dancers. They're wonderful performers. I don't necessarily think they're wonderful singers. I'm a little bit sceptical as to whether they sing on their tracks at all. Because you're in a situation where we're very close, if not already there, where virtual technologies can write and sing and produce and master. They can do all of it. Yeah. And we're, we're not very far away from that situation where you go, OK, I need a hit record. Um, press this button. There we go. That's good. Yes, yeah, so that's fantastic. That'll do. That's my next hit. Um, and I think that'll be a shame because it will be, by all available metrics, perfection. Yeah. It will be a perfect song. And once the perfect song is created, what's the point in creating something imperfect? Exactly. It's just a mere copy. You kill the soul of the, of the track. You kill it. Yes. Yeah, but perfection. if you've noticed, recent pop music, particularly, so I would say the last five to ten years, has not a lot of soul in the tracks that are really successful. Yeah. I think that's where your man Ed Sheeran comes in. I think there is, at least in some of his tracks, at least I think there's some Ed Sheeran in there. Yeah. I'm a little more sceptical about some other artists who I won't talk about in case I happen to meet them. Yeah. And they say, you were mean about me on Dav's, uh, Dav's radio show. I'm, going, I'm really <laughs> sorry. I, I didn't mean it. But let's talk about somebody we admire. And I, I think what Ed Sheeran has done is fantastic. Wow. Yeah, yeah he's brilliant. Brilliant. But I don't think we get yeah. told the whole story. Yeah, of course. Of course. This is a man who claimed to be sleeping on tube trains. Ah. Then he gets discovered busking. Then he's selling out Wembley Stadium. Yeah. You know as well as I do. Yeah. That's not really how it happens. No. Of course not. It's even, a good story. Even the hair colouring and the record label. It's a good narrative. I mean, I suspect he is... I don't know, 60 years old. I think it's all done with smoke and mirrors and a, and a ginger wig. I think he's a, he's, a, he's a fantastically talented young fella, far too talented for the age he is. Yeah. But I know, I know he has a team with him who help him and produce him and nurture him and work with him. And wow, amazing to be in that position. Fair play to him. He's done great. Yeah, definitely. I, I, I was researching him, him, him recently. Do you know who I was also researching recently? Um... The Count of Saint Germain. Wow. Okay. <laughs> and, and what did you find? Oh, it's just, that, that's going to be a, 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 a long, a long one in terms of, uh, <laughs> in terms of, uh, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't want to get myself into trouble with the wrong sort of people. Okay. Yeah. I think that's a good idea. Maybe it's an off-air conversation. Yeah. <laughs> but but uh, okay. So. Uh, and here's me, I was, I was about to say, I, I remember the first time I, I stumped up the money and I, I always literally go hungry for the things that I, I need in, in the studio. Like I remember buying my first ever Cubase. Um, yes. 420 quid or something dumb like that. Oh, yeah. and that was an old money as well when it was yeah. worth something. Yeah, that's, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> <Digital village. laughs> I, I, that was the choice between Cubase or a car at that point, wasn't it? Yeah, that that's was right. It was, it was kind of car money, I remember, yes, yes. Well, recently it was the choice between an old 7 series and that Prologue 16 there. Like, I could have picked up a, wow. a, a 7 series for like an old one for 12, 1300 quid. But I, I, I just figured I, I love the old 7 series and, uh, you know, I, just, I, lo I love old cars. I can work on them on myself in my downtime. But uh, I do believe in that, that, that sacrifice for the things that you, you, you believe in. But you've also made me realise you've got to be real. Think about the family. Sometimes you've got to sell some gear. You know, is it, is it, you know are you not actually using it in the, in the studio? Um, now... Are you familiar with Cherry Audio and uh, Modular Synthesis, uh, Synthesis and, you know, that sort of putting these little things together, VCO, VCA is what you may call it? Yes, but only in an abstract way. Okay. So I know of them. Yeah. I've deliberately not taken the time to learn or to try them out. Yeah. Because that's how the craving starts again. Yeah, the craving. If you are... <laughs> And, and it is. It's a. It's a. Um, it's it's a. It's a craving. If I if I if I see it, and I think, well, that looks great. Hmm. Do I need one? Well, not really, because we're still exploring the equipment we have. Yeah. Do I want one? Well, that's a different thing. And if I go to a store or if I buy one online, we're suddenly we're in that realm where I suddenly something I didn't know existed. I suddenly need. 
Yeah. It becomes, it goes very quickly from a, I'd like it to, I want it to, I need it. And if only I had that, I would be the next um, Billie Eilish. Because I, I read that Billie Eilish and her brother used this particular piece of kit. So she's really successful. Yeah. So if I have what she has, then we'll be... And I'm afraid it doesn't work like that. It really doesn't work like that. It, it's You could do magnificent things with minimal equipment. Yeah. And it's all about the songwriting. It's all about the creativity. It's about the ideas. You get to the point where you can't express your ideas because you don't have a chaosolator. Yeah. And you need to find yourself the money to buy a chaosolator. But again, as you said, difficult choices. Do I need a car? Do I need a keyboard? Do I need a synth mod? What is it I need? So whilst I love, love, love the idea of plugging in these plugs and creating a synthesizer sound. Yes, yes. I can get a plug in, probably a free plug in, that will create 90% of that sound for me. And I don't have to explain to my wife why I've spent hundreds, thousands of pounds on another piece of kit. Um, because, again, I've been through that route with guitars. I've been through that route with guitar music. If only I had, and then I get whatever it is. Yes. And then it's, yes, I'm not actually any better. I'm just somebody who has to buy a bigger guitar rack. Ah, you're right. Um, you're right. <laughs> you, you've just basically summed sum me up, dude. Like, basically, it's called the GAS, well, the gear acquisition syndrome, isn't it? Oh my gosh! And but if it makes you happy, Dave, and if it does, if it makes you happy, and it's not at the expense of other parts of your life or other parts of your family, yeah. then fair play to you. Yeah. If you have that kind of um, money to invest in new equipment, I'm not knocking it. It's yeah. fantastic. It's wonderful. I'm in a position where I don't have the inclination to do that anymore. Yeah. I get to the point where we need a piece of kit. We needed a piece of kit recently. Um, I bought a, um, a DDJ okay. system, a DDJ 400. Okay. Um, not for me, but for Timmy. It was it was my gift to him for kind of a for, for his getting signed. Yes. Um, I just presented him with with a box and went, "There you go," because that's what we needed to take ourselves to the next level when we play live. We needed that. What we didn't need was the DDJ 1000 or 2000 or 5000 or whatever else. Yeah. What we needed was the piece of kit that would do what we wanted to do, do it well, that would be robust, that was more than a toy, that would go in a flight case, because I bought the flight case as well, as you have to buy the flight case. Yes. Um, but what do we need to create a new live show? What we need is a DDJ in this case, 400, and that's what I bought. Absolutely, because it was something. It would take us to the next, and it has. Yeah, you know, Timmy. Timmy would not have bought that because he has a different set of priorities. Whereas I went, Do you know what? In order for us to be the band we want to be, we need this, and so I invested in it and I gave it to him. Um, and he loves it. He absolutely loves it. You know, and he's taken to it as he always does with technology. He's fantastic with it. Within within moments, apparently, you uh, you know, all of a sudden there's these things coming out of it. And it was one of the decisions about um, about not doing the live vocals. Yes, was the fact that you can loop parts of a track and you can put in extra drum beats and you can put samples on it. Yes, if you've got some poor guy stood at the front in a spacesuit going, "What's going on?" As the chorus come in, I don't. Oh, oh no! And that guy would be me, Dad. That would that would be me looking foolish while he stood with some headphones over his helmet in the background, going, "Hey!" <laughs> Everybody's got hands in the air, and me standing there going, "I'm Sean Ryder. I've become Sean Ryder. Wow. I don't know where I am. Help me!" Um, so Marvin can now take the heat. If it all goes wrong, it's Marvin's fault. I love it. I love it. I love it. Could you please tell me? A funny studio or live performance story, please, Damo. Yes, I can. And it's, it's, um, there's a couple of stories. One is I was working uh, a few years ago on a piece of music for um, an advert, uh, actually for Ribena. It was a song that we'd been asked to create about a boy and his donkey. Okay. Don't ask. I never saw the campaign, but it's the same 30 seconds over and over and over. And for seven, eight hours, we worked and worked and worked on it. And at one point, the dog in the studio got up, walked across, and threw up on our feet. 
<laughs> because she was so sick of the piece of music and we looked at each other and we went she's right she's right this is not why we started making music this is how we're trying to make a living making music we don't want to write about ride beaner and donkeys and no and we never worked together again after that because the dog had spoken. The dog was our Yoko Ono. The dog was the thing that split up that relationship. Uh, we're still very good friends, I hate to add, but that was the point where we'd started to make a little bit of money. We were starting to get remix work. We were starting to get advert work. And we suddenly realised, we don't want to do that. Yeah. No, let's just not. And so we stopped at that point. Um, so that, that was a, a story um, from the studio. I do have a stage story. Yes. Um, which I prized out of Timmy, which was at the end of, of, of one of the sets. Um, uh, Timmy tried to smash his guitar. What? Like a punk, like a punk rock star. Yeah. He got to the end and tried and failed to smash his guitar. <laughs> Bloody All that happened to this guitar, Dav, was one of the fret dots popped out. You kidding? Yeah, so one of, one of the little Mother of Pearl things came out and he kind of, he gave it a good few whacks and nothing happened. And in the end, he just kind of got slower and then just dropped it on the stage and walked off. Um, but it was it was the, the classic uh, clash, smashing the bass guitar moment, iconic yeah. moment in rock and roll history recreated. And the damn thing just would not break. Oh my it was God. made of sterner stuff. It just bounced That's every amazing. time. But what guitar is that then to the build quality? Do you know, I couldn't even tell you what it was. It was just, whatever it was, I think it was made out of a piece of mahogany sideboard because it weighed a ton. <laughs> and he did, he did his best, but it, yeah, it just did not break. Um, and it's... It's really strange when you hear, I and mean, that's from, from Timmy's kind of rock and roll past. Yeah. And Timmy is such a quiet, mild-mannered, careful person. And he won't tell me what happened during the gig that made him want to smash the guitar. Um, I suspect, because of the way he is, I suspect it was the sound wasn't good, or somebody else in the band hadn't performed the way that he'd expected. You know, You know what it's like? months and months of rehearsal and you get to a gig and it's awful it's it can be absolutely soul destroying and so his protest his final moment in this band was to smash his guitar and then he failed to do it um although he did walk away from the band so um but yes yeah, so there you go that, that's, that's some rock and roll stories from the uh non-stop erotic cabaret we, we've not always been the uh, the mild mannered um helmeted peculiar people that you see in front of you today wow wow um now, what, what have you embraced this whole, you know, even in the software realm, wavetable synthesis, the newfangled stuff? No. no. That was a very simple answer, wasn't it? <laughs> so, the, the whole process of creating the original tracks, I literally, I have no idea in how Timmy creates his sounds and how Timmy creates the original tracks. I just don't know. If I knew, then I would start trying to do it myself. Yes. And I would ruin everything we have. So whilst I have GarageBand, I deinstalled it from my iPad. But rather annoyingly, it keeps coming back. Yeah. Um, it's like a band from the 70s. It just keeps coming back to annoy you. Um, but I have, again stepped away and deliberately stopped myself from learning about the process yeah. you could have all sorts of things going on and it's not that i'm not interested but i know if i become interested i will become obsessed i will have to know i will have to do it i will have to do it myself at which point it's over for non erotic cabaret it becomes the demo devotion show Oh. Possibly featuring Timmy Faith, but eventually it's just me, isn't it, with a tape recorder, and it's all over. Oh, um, man. So, whilst he might be doing all sorts of wonderful trickery, and as I said, he builds his own synths, the guy knows what he's doing. Yeah, he does. It may well have this kind of stuff stored away. Yeah. But I don't know and I don't inquire because it's a little bit like the Wizard of Oz pulling back the curtain. Yeah, you're right. You're right. You're right. I believe him to be a wizard. I don't want to see that it's just a guy behind the curtain. So leave the curtain there, wait for the track to come, go, oh my gosh, then run to my studio and add my bits to it. That's the way it works for us. Another question. That's a good answer. Um, about the Wizard of Oz as well. Um, is there anything you've changed your mind about musically where you found you've been wrong regarding your, you know, your method or, you know, your judgment? 
<laughs> I tell you what, Dav, I was wrong about an entire genre of music. What? Why? I have completely ignored, up until recent times, heavy metal. Okay. Okay. Wow. And a friend of mine introduced me. Uh, the, I think the gateway drug was uh, was Metallica. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And before I knew it, Metallica became Megadeth, and Megadeth became uh, Melt Banana, and and suddenly I was listening to this music, this this amazing stuff that I literally hadn't. So I had what 30, 40, 50 years of music that I'd never listened to, I'd never paid any attention to. And some of the stuff, not all of it, but some of the stuff that those bands do is magnificent. And how you pack so much energy and noise into such a small waveform, I've still yet, like, yet to learn. I mean, some of that stuff, there, there is a, a Metallica album where they have a full orchestra. Yeah. So Metallica, loudest band in the world. Have a full orchestra. I know. Done that. Yeah. Let's put an orchestra on. And, and, you know, as a producer, I'm fascinated by how can you make that work? How can you, that can, how can that even come to be? Um, and if you ever uh, talk to somebody about crossing over genres and mixing genres, mm. whether you like Metallica or not, that's a magnificent example of nice. where they've taken something that was great I made it greater by adding something to it. And that's like all great partnerships, where they, they both bring something that's great, but what you get it together is greater. That's fantastic to hear. So if I'm out in my car, yes, um, because I'm not allowed to listen to it in the house, but if I'm in the car and I'm not playing the synth-pop classics, I am banging my head to Slayer and Slipknot and all of those crazy bands. Um because it's just so out of my sphere and it's all new to me it's wow. all new to me and, and i was wrong about it i dismissed it as something i wouldn't be interested in and it was all just noise it was just no not for me and then i started paying attention to it and some of the musicianship is magnificent if you've ever seen the guitarist that plays with marilyn manson john five used to play with them I'm learning. <laughs> I'm learning John, John, John Five. Yes. Have a look on YouTube at John Five playing, not rock music but country music. Yes. The guy is magnificent. You wouldn't think it from listening to Marilyn Manson because it was all very basic riffs over big drums, which is great. Hmm. And then when you see John Five performing on his own, or even just warming up. And you just think, gosh, the, the musicianship is out of this world. But you'd never guess from the people he worked with. I think he's with uh, Rob Zombie. Oh, yeah, yeah. There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I say I think I say <laughs> I think he is. I know he is. Or John Five and the Creatures. Because, again, I, it was on those little rabbit holes. You know, I started watching a bit, and then it's like, oh, if you like this John Five, you like that John Five. And so you go on, and so you've seen all sorts of things. And I'd always, in my head, I guess, put down... Um, traditional rock musicians and heavy metal musicians as, as somehow less sophisticated than the music that i enjoy yeah yeah and it's absolutely no less sophisticated they are just as good at what they do as the people that i admire are good at what they do brilliant you know i'm a lifelong prince fan oh, prince was magnificent at everything yeah but one of the greatest guitarists in the world you wouldn't know it from listening to prince because his musicianship always served the song. Wow. His musicianship, what does this song need? Does the song kiss? Does it need a five-minute guitar solo? It does not. However, there is a video, again on YouTube, My Guitar Gently Weeps, where Prince is playing alongside some other musicians in a tribute to the late George Harrison. Yeah. And he comes out and he blows these guys off the stage because he is magnificent and nobody in that audience expects it because they've heard a little bit here and there with a little bit of a solo on Purple Rain. That's quite good. You know, oh, there's nothing on that song, so he, can't, he probably can't play it. He was an absolute outstanding talent. Um, and a big fan of synths, bringing us right back to where we started. Yeah, that's right. You know, some, something like 1999, where would it be without the synth? You know, wow. He, he, he really, really rocked. And was, I've found since he's kind of a bridge between pop music and rock music yeah. that I hadn't really appreciated. He's that kind of, a bit like Metallica, were a gateway for me to, to metal music. He is 
inspired by all of the funkadelic and the punk music all the way through to the heavy rock music and that's a beautiful journey if you can kind of take that journey but sadly he's no longer with us and that's yeah, a great show because he was magnificent For and not somebody you might think would be on my playlist i think it's it's, it's, it's yeah it's many great people have been have been lost you know it's just um oh may, may, may god rest his soul you know um have, do you experiment with frequencies in terms of uh, tuning so you know i'm a big fan of um f you know it, like the harmonium i have an old indian harmonium next to me oh that do you know i love the sound of those really I, I, no it's, it's it is sonically so beautiful because it's rich and it's alive it's got a depth to it that's right and, you know we, we're talking about um the idea of of FM synthesis, and then we talk about analog synthesis. But going back, those are instruments are absolutely wonderful, and there's a beauty to them that you just—I don't care how many times you sample it, it's not going to sound like a really good player playing that. Oh, it's, it, it's, it just isn't. You, you, well, that thing. Thank you, man. That that thing. Uh, A equals four four four. Right. So I just, I just figured that. Um, a, a, a lot a lot of work i'm doing i've done a lot of work at 432 you know a equals 432 then you got a equals 444 you know so and how does that resonate with the body i'm working yes. with you know i'm working with a um i'll do some weird stuff dude like I'm, I'm actually working in terms of uh where water holds memory and can we deprogram water using mag magnets wow. and stuff like that <laughs> so, that that is some deep stuff, Dav. That is some yeah, res <laughs> respect to you for that. Oh, no, respect to um, you for being you. <laughs> but, but you know, I, it's it's one of those things where, in a lot of ways, I'm culturally ignorant. So I use Western tunings and Western scales and a Western keyboard. Yeah. And I do have instruments that I inherited from my father that don't obey those rules, Brilliant. and they're magnificent. However. You create an electronic tune, everything is perfect. Yeah. You start putting the live, particularly stringed instruments or wind instruments on it, and they're all just a little bit off. And whilst that gives it the character, yes. it also jars with electronica. And if you can mix those two together, then you are a better man than I. Because it's... it's you've just reminded me about ancient instruments. Yeah. I was in Thailand a couple of years ago, and I went to a Buddhist temple. Yeah. And I was met at the door by a Buddhist monk standing next to a big gong. As far as I was concerned, the big gong, my experience of big gongs was Depeche Mode. You get to one point in the song, and then you hit it with the uh, with the mallet, and it goes bong, and you think, that's, that's fantastic, that's wonderful. Yeah. However, a monk gave me the hammer, he held my hand, and we rubbed the gong with the surface of this this uh, cotton covered mallet yeah and it started and it started and it got louder and louder and louder and it vibrated through my body um, in the way that we talked about synths vibrating through your body yeah it was it was absolutely wonderful and afterwards we just stopped and, and kind of stared in a moment as the sound died away and I, I gave him back the, the little um, the hammer thing and, and, and said, thank you. Um, and he just smiled at me because I had felt what he gets to feel every day. He had communicated without language part of his belief, part of his love, part of his music to me, all without saying a word. And it was, it was a beautiful moment. It really was. But the feeling of it, yes. and that's where something where you talked about the idea of energies and spiritualities, mm. Music very often can be a background distraction. It's something you have on in the car or yeah. in the house. You do, but at its very deepest level, it has the power to move people, to change people. And that's what all those years ago, people who wrote religious music, people who created religious buildings with echoes yeah. um, and reverbs, these were not mistakes. These were deliberate almost early synthesizers they created these effects physically with masonry and wood and all of these things they created something that would take the music and allow the music to be more powerful allow it to move people allow it to tap into them allow them to feel the music true and the closest most people get to that these days is going to a festival 
yeah. where you can feel the music. Yeah. So they have such a big sound system and such a, a wide sonic range where you can feel it. And you can either dance, you can leave, or you can throw up on the spot, depending on what the music is and how it does it to you. But you feel it, you actually feel something. And the worst thing in the world for me, for a piece of art, yes. is for you to experience it and feel nothing. Oh, wow. Empty so if you see a painting and it yeah. says nothing to you, or you hear a piece of music and it doesn't speak to you, it doesn't matter if it makes you laugh or cry or you hate it or you love it, you must feel something. Yeah. Because if you feel nothing, then who cares? That's very, very true. Very true. But you also have to accept that someone else might feel something by hearing it and listening to it. And this is why I will not um, dismiss music. If somebody's really into something, a bit like heavy metal. Yeah. Do you know what? Give me some recommendations. I'm going to give it a go. And I could feel it. I could feel there was something in there that I hadn't tapped into. Um, and that was a wonderful journey to be able to go on with him. And he was saying, oh, if you like that, you'd like this. And we had one or two little blind uh, cul-de-sacs where I went, oh, no, I wasn't keen on that too much. Uh, in fact, Melt Banana was the end of a cul-de-sac at one point. We got to that point, I went, I can't do this. I'm not enjoying this anymore. And he went, oh, in that case, why don't you try so-and-so? Why don't you try this? Um, and that was wonderful to be guided on that kind of adventure. Yeah. But going back to what we're saying about ancient instruments, ancient religions, ancient buildings, they got it. And I think in many ways we've lost it. And people's faith has changed. People's lack of faith has become the norm. It's true. I think in, in most communities, mm. whether people describe them for being a particular religion or not, what they're not going is they're not worshipping at a temple. Yeah. They're not going to a, a church or a cathedral. They're not part of that. And part of my upbringing, I was raised as a Catholic. Yes. Part of that was not just a ritual, but the singing, the celebration of that particular religion. And it was the joint nature of it. And the only time I felt it re in recent times was when I accidentally went to see a football match. How, because how my, do you mean accidentally? <laughs> well, my brother-in-law had some tickets for a Liverpool game. Yes. And he was let down by the person that was going with him. And I'm not a football guy. Um, but I said, you know, I'll come with you. I love new experiences. Let's go with you. And being amongst the fans of Liverpool at Anfield, there's a power to it. There's a power that reminded me of being part of, of Christian Catholic worship back in the day, yeah. when you're in a cathedral full of people. There's a kind of energy that comes from it. And so whilst I didn't, I don't even know who won, to be honest with you, I wasn't really paying attention, but the experience, the sensory experience of being at a Premier League um, game was amazing. And I got it. I understood what people felt, particularly if they haven't had a religious upbringing, if they haven't experienced that, that community, that, that well of energy, you can get that, and I did get that, from sitting in a, with a group of football fans in a football stadium, and suddenly the little light went on, and I went, I get it. I get why you do this every Saturday. Wow. I, I get it. And I, and I hadn't, because again, like heavy metal, I'd ignored it. I'm not a football guy. I'm not really interested. I was always terrible at it. And then the opportunity came along, and, and as I always do with these things, I went, I'll do it. Brilliant, let's do it, let's go for it. But there is that same energy, and it's as if the football, the crowd mentality taps into that energy. And it doesn't matter whether it's football chants, or it's monastic chants, or it's people singing in a temple, singing in a church. Mm. And it all happens, and it all gets together, and there's the reverb, and there's the crowd, and there's the energy. It's powerful stuff. Very it's powerful. powerful, powerful stuff. And it's... it's when people in the past describe football as being a religion, I always was a little bit, okay, yeah. if you say so. And then to go and get it and go, oh, right, okay, so what you're getting is, is, is akin to a religious experience, the power of when your home team scores a goal. Wow. Wow, because it's, it's an instant rush of adrenaline and joy from everybody around you. You get carried away with it. Um, and... It, it just reminded me of being back back in the church and, and singing in the choir and, and uh, praising the Lord as we did back in the day. Oh, very um, stuff, yeah. 
it, it is. But those, again, those original instruments, they tapped into that. They tapped into energies. They tapped into to vibrations in the body. You were saying earlier on about your pyramid. It's yeah. the same thing. Yeah. They're accessing things that we've forgotten about. Because in most traditions, it's an oral tradition. It's passed down. And yeah. generation to generation. And then the generations become less interested. And they get into radio and synthesizers yeah. instead of going into the family religion or, you know, we, we go and do other things and religion becomes less important to us but religion isn't just about rules and regulations and which god it's about a communal being and communal well-being and being together and joining together and creating something bigger than yourself yeah and that's kind of been forgotten about and i think that's why we're in the covid situation and there's a lot of lonely people out there I, I think if the uh, religious groups it wouldn't be like that though very true and i think could that be part of an the agenda to speak to isolate people and therefore you you weaken people because there's strength in in numbers and that you know it's just um where a person feels isolated i mean i'm gonna be honest with you the whole lockdown thing for me it hasn't affected me as much and my friends are similar that we live in our studios and we're constantly working either i'm doing yes. radio work or i'm i'm producing something and like for me it hasn't really affected me but i'm not so much no. of a, you know I, 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 I toddle down to tesco or go to aldi or what have you but but at the end of the day um it hasn't affected me so much but um the whole lockdown uh, you know has that affected you i mean how has that affected you in terms of going out are you an out and about sort of um sort of, sort of person you know so the thing i miss the most about the outside world yeah is cappuccinos <laughs> i love it I love it. I love, I, it. I love a good cappuccino yeah. and I can't make one myself. And when lockdowns are lifted, the first thing I do is go somewhere where I can have a cappuccino. Um, but it's, it's one of those things where I would say, apart from that, again, appreciate how lucky we are. Yeah, we we do things. Mm. We spend a lot of time on our own. Yeah. So the fact that you can or cannot go into the nearest town doesn't really affect me one way or the other until it does, until I need a cappuccino, at which point I feel slightly aggrieved. But I have done some work with my wife at her school um, where we've been running a food bank for people. Beautiful. Those people are the people in need. Yeah. The fact that I can't get a cappuccino is neither here nor there. The fact that they need to rely on charity to feed their children is a disgrace. Yeah. And I know we're not meant to be talking about politics. No, that's fine. But it's one of those things where, Same. again, yeah. we have a duty to look after those who can't look after themselves. Damn right. Particularly now. And when we don't do it, you know, if, if you are feeling a bit smug and complacent, spend some time working at a food bank. Go and see what the people are doing and what the people are going through. And it, it's, it's, again, it's that thing about uh, learning humility. Um, you know, you don't have to volunteer and do it forever. I've only done a few days, if I'm honest. Yeah. But I got to see people who really, they were relying on this and they were incredibly grateful. But I couldn't help thinking, why are they having to do this? It's engineered that way, bro. That, 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 that is it. They've engineered the whole thing that way to to make everyone... And that's a disappointment. Yeah. You know, my, my wife works in uh, Manningham, in the centre of Bradford. Yeah. So we do a lot of work with and within the Asian community. Yeah. Yeah. And the levels of love and respect that come out of the community are fantastic. But the levels of poverty and hardship that people are living with is appalling. Nobody has to live like that. We're supposed to be a first world country. We're supposed to be a developed nation. Why are people coming to me for toilet rolls and a bag of rice? That shouldn't, that shouldn't be happening. No. That's not civilization. No, it's not. It's, it's, no? it's not. It's... Um... It's almost like the whole thing's orchestrated, isn't it? So, um... Do you know, the one thing that makes me think it's not orchestrated yeah. is that it's such a mess. Hmm. Okay. I'd like to think if it was orchestrated, it would be orchestrated a down site better. Ah. We wouldn't have needed lockdown two because lockdown one would have done the trick. We wouldn't have needed COVID-19 because we'd already have things under control that they're trying to control. Yeah. Yeah. I think, and, it's, it's, and in some ways it's more worrying, Dav, I think perhaps nobody's in charge and nobody has a plan and that perhaps we're just stumbling along. Wow. Um, wow. You know, and it's, 
in some ways that's more worrying because if you thought okay there's going to be some hard times and then there's going to be some good times yeah that would be more acceptable than there's some hard times oh there's some more hard times i mean can you remember a time when we weren't in recession can you remember a time when good point uh, prices weren't going up and wages weren't going down when everybody was employed because that's not happened within my lifetime true but there's been one thing after another one disaster after another and all that keeps me from staying awake all night worrying about it is the fact that i think it's just plain ineptitude i don't think anybody knows what's going on they just try and make the best of it um that was a surprisingly deep statement wasn't it but it's true yeah, yeah. I, I don't think anybody's really got it worked out and i know again youtube rabbit hole type in the words conspiracy theory yeah. type in illuminati new world order whatever you want to call it yeah. and you will receive all sorts of information telling you that this is what's happening this is why it's happening so and so and so and so and you go further and further and deeper and deeper i'd rather not look yeah because if this is engineered if this is a thing that somebody somewhere has created deliberately that's worse than thinking this is just a mistake this Good is point. just an accident very true that 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 is that's that's wow well i, I never looked at it from that angle that's it's, it's very good that that is very true we've got to do the best that we can in this in this situation and um for me um many people used to say to me buy yourself a big house and all the rest of it. get yourself a house and everything and why are you buying all the studio gear during the whole lockdown, that same house became their prison. Yes. And the studio gear, that's what kept me sane. Well, they were kicking off with their missus and having arguments, right? And getting turfed out of the house and all that, and with the police yes. and all that. And then you give them on the phone, and go, exactly, if you'd have kept yourself busy, we, we, we all need something to keep ourselves busy. You know, it, Mental health. Oh, trust me. And mental wealth. Yeah. I don't think they can be bought. Exactly. And yeah. it could be, as, could be as simple as having some crayons and, and some paper to draw. It's true. It's true. You know, it doesn't, it's just something that takes you out of yourself that for however long you're doing it means you're not thinking about the woes of the world because I do believe we're in a position where we cannot change the world. We can only change the part of the world in which we exist. So we can act locally. We can do the nice things. We can, um, you know, if somebody struggling in the co-op and they can't pay for the groceries just get your card out boot the machine they've got some groceries you've made their life a little bit better and a little bit easier yeah. that kindness will be repaid a thousand times in a thousand ways wow um, the ladies the ladies in the co-op have never looked at me the same since and to be fair i am quite peculiar in the first place but they always bring this up and I'm, it's, it was just a thing there was a young lady, she was struggling, she had a kid that was crying, her card was refused. How could you not? Yeah. It was I, 20 pounds or something. You know, and I, I'm lucky that 20 pounds is, is still money. I'm still a Yorkshireman, Dav. Yeah. So it's a fair amount of money, but it was 20 pounds that meant so much more to her than it did to me. And whilst I'm not a big fan of charities, yeah. I am a big fan of charity and direct action and helping people out directly and that was an opportunity where because i was brought up well by my parents i didn't think about it this person needs something i have yes Boop, there we go um and i left before she realized and um, apparently she had a bit of a cry about it um and which was never my intention i just wanted to make her day a bit better because it was the day we signed the record deal it was the day where I got the news to yeah. say, we're going to sign you. I was celebrating. And instead of buying, I don't know, what would I celebrate with? Probably <laughs> a cake. Yeah. Um, instead of buying, you know, I, I just didn't. I celebrated by helping somebody else out. If every time you celebrated, you celebrated by helping somebody else out, Beautiful. what a great world we'd live in. My word, what a much nicer place it would be to walk around. If, if, if people were just helping people because it's the right thing to do, not because of any sense of guilt or responsibility or taxation, but just the ability to make somebody's life just a little bit better. That's a gift, isn't it? to you it's it's a it's, it's a it's a beautiful gift um i hadn't meant to tell that story no man no man no no, no. demo demo that, that's it, it's it says a uh, says a lot about you you, you I'll, I'll, you're a lovely soul 
you know you. You're, you're you're uh you you really you, you really are and um I'm it hasn't always been that way dad dude you are it hasn't always been that way really that's a big so, thing to say it's a big thing to say that. i was self-employed i worked for myself i ran club nights i ran magazines i ran my own businesses yeah. and if you want to swim with sharks you have to be a shark dude radio sharks yeah there you go so yeah. you have to at least mimic if not replicate their behavior in order to get on in order to move forwards i can't do the mimicking thing though <laughs> <laughs> then it's difficult yeah. to do and it's yeah, yeah. you know yeah. however talented you are yeah. however uh, good you are at what you do you may find that unless you become that guy yeah you're not going to be that guy if that makes sense i'll never so be you're not going guy. to be <laughs> yeah you're not going to be so and so because at some point yeah they had to do something they're not proud of in order to attain to leapfrog the next person to get to the position they're in and this is where it's wonderful to have a record label and a manager in whatever field you're in, somebody that's somebody that's the bad guy. Yeah. If you can remain the good guy, that's perfect. But don't be naive in thinking that your management hasn't had to pull some strings or perhaps affect somebody else negatively in order to get you the success that you eventually have. Yeah. I think it, it, yeah. it would be wonderful to say, all you have to do is be talented and nice it's and you'll be successful. I've met a lot of talented, nice people who are not successful. What you need is a partner or an organisation. Ed Sheeran, I bet he's a lovely guy. Yeah. yeah but I bet there's some absolute Machiavellian masterminds behind Ed Sheeran, the product. Oh, hell yeah. Hell yeah. That have allowed him to be a nice guy to sleep on people's sofas you know yeah, it's, that's just how it works it's not how it should work it's how it does work but let's say you've gone through life being a bit of a scallywag being a bit of a shark yeah. you get into a position where you no longer have to do that to progress yeah then you can start paying some of that back paying it back. making amends for not being it and i didn't do i didn't do bad stuff yeah but i would make choices that i was less than comfortable with in order to help my business to survive in order to put food on the table wow. you know and it's one of those things where you can tell people as much as you like and they won't believe you yes it has to come from lived experience and you can live in a positive way and affect people positively you can live in a negative way and affect people negatively the end point if we're honest about it, the end point is death. Yeah, yeah, very true. And whether you believe in an afterlife or not, mm. you have a journey to make. And I know that being a ruthless, mm. let's say amoral, yeah. uh, business guy, yeah. was making me physically and mentally ill. It was, it was making me very unhappy, and it was making me unwell. Yeah. And so you have a choice. You can either keep going, or you can get off the roundabout. And I did. I went back into education. I sold my businesses. Um, I went back into education. And I, I, I've, uh, you know, that, that was a wonderful point in my life because it was literally killing me. D did you study I something that you enjoyed, clearly? <laughs> <laughs> I did a master's degree in screenwriting. Bloody hell. Okay. Okay. Wow. So this is, a, this is another life of mine entirely. Yeah, yeah. But yes, I had being a journalist and a film critic and a theatre critic and a music critic. And when I was looking around for what to do with my life, my wife said, well, you're always criticising other people's things. Why don't you learn how to do something yourself? Yeah. Wise words. Yeah, yeah. So I did. I went and did a master's degree in screenwriting. I ended up um, making a film. I won some awards. I um, had a film at the New York Film Festival, which meant I was there for 9-11, which was quite an experience, let me tell you. Yeah. Um, yeah. I got out, I went out to Hollywood, and I, I had a movie option, and all of those things in my previous life. But people will tell you that, particularly in Hollywood, that those people will stab you in the back. And I'm here to tell you, Dav, they will not stab you in the back. They will stab you in the front, whilst laughing in your face, picking your pocket and chatting up your girlfriend. It is the most ruthless industry I have ever 
born witness to, and I was only on the edges of it. I was only on the edges. And again, I had to make choices which were, were to the detriment of other people to get to where I got. And I just thought, I don't want to do this. Yeah. I can't do this. I don't want to be that guy again because he's there. He's always there. Dude, you're right. And I, I, I'd gone away from the business world and I'd found myself going through education, having a wonderful time, having a great time, and suddenly I'm having to be ruthless again. And I thought, well, no, this is why I got out in the first place. Yeah, you're this right. is what I didn't want. I want to be the kind of person who can look himself in the mirror, albeit wearing a mask and a helmet, yeah. and, and, not, and not have to look away, not have to go, oh, man, I'm ashamed of that. And that's something that if you've come from a religious background, mm. um, one of the first things they teach you about is being ashamed of yeah. something bad. Mm. And that stays with you, whether you're still with the church or with the, with the religion, that stays with you. You know when you've done wrong. Oh, trust but me. But yeah. you can atone for it. You can do better things. You can do better. Can you do better? It doesn't matter if you win. What matters is how you played the game. Can you do better? Can you make life better for not just you, but those people around you? And if you can, it's your duty to do it. Very true. Very, very true. Whether you believe in, in gods or whatever else, it's your duty as a human being to try and make the lives of the human beings that you're surrounded by just a little bit better. You can do it any way you like. You can do it with music. You can do it with film. You can do it with your art. You can do it with running a food bank. You can do all of these positive actions. Yeah, you're right. You're, 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 you're very correct, Damon, because I've, I've I've spent a lot of time, unfortunately, um, studying um, finance and corporate law over the last oh, wow. years. Yeah, and um, I had to use my keyboard as a prop for my books, and that's what hurt me the most. And I thought wow. we take every day for granted, and the fact that we're going to wake up tomorrow. And I thought, do I want to work in a hedge fund or some private equity environment? Is that is that what I want to do? I thought. No. Yes. I thought, I thought not for me. I thought I thought I wouldn't survive. I I I know I am not the shark. And my friends tell me, Dave, you are not a shark. <laughs> so I went. So I was a shark. You'll be chewed up alive. They go. That is the viper pit, right? And you will you, you will yes. not survive in in the viper pit. Yes. They go. What, what are your talents? They go. I just you know music and radio to stay there in, in, in a sonic world yes. so uh, what you said resonated when you, when you said about the film industry because I also worked on the I worked on the film sets for the new uh, Morbius you know the crown for Netflix and all the rest of that wow yeah. okay so I, I, I saw certain things and like I'll, I'll, I'll say it straight the bigger the film the bigger the production yep the worse the conditions for the employees on set does not surprise me at all yeah 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 so so uh, I, I spent a lot of time working on film sets to uh, to get the money to put this radio show together to buy studio gear blah blah, blah. and i i learned a lot being there you know yes. I, th I think the one day i remember um, i was standing up on duty and we was guarding um the film equipment and we're filming at horse guards and i stood up from the monday uh you know like 14 hours straight tuesday wednesday it's only thursday where the heads of the ministry of defense complained to sony and then sony complained to the locations manager somehow then they brought a chair across because they said that our wow. guards which are armed guards are walking around in you know london um they're yeah. having breaks and they're noticing you're standing up so i've had the heads of uh, heads of mod uh come down and and uh, and talk to me at, at horse guards you know, and um, wow. the conditions there are, are, are disgusting. My dream was was the radio show, and so I'm not worried about the money side of things, right? I, I, I really, I really don't care anymore. Because if, if I was a materialistic, greedy, um, you know, if, if I operated on that on that plane, I first I wouldn't survive with the sharks. They chew me up, and I'll be shark bait or whatever. Um, uh, secondly, I wouldn't be using the time. Or you mentioned earlier about your parents giving you. Uh, gifts and abilities you, you wouldn't be using those gifts and abilities you know that, that, that that's important i have a deep interest yeah. in the use of sound for the movement of objects and levitation and these weird wow. yeah, it sounds a bit nutty but um you mentioned I, 
I totally get it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So because so. it's the only explanation yeah. apart from yeah. superior technologies created and utilized by aliens. Oh, very true. To explain many of the ancient structures that are here today. Yeah. Where you, they look at them and you go, you can't have done that. You can't have done that with the tools we have now. True. Therefore, there must be something else. And sound is certainly an interesting one because like anything else, it's an energy. It's a vibration. It has power, whether that. that be to affect people mentally or physically, but also why not objects? Why not be able to move a piece of stone with the vibrations from your, your, um, your hands channeled through a, I don't know, it, I don't understand it but I certainly don't poo-poo it, Dav it's something that we don't understand and we should understand and yeah. perhaps one day we will understand Very, very, very um, true um, Demo um, what what can we expect from you like, you know, I know that the whole lockdown thing till the second but then again, you guys are up north your lockdown has been a lot more savage than London, hasn't it? Yeah <laughs> Know, well, that's the thing. The politicians all live in London, so the city is run for their convenience. Yeah, yeah. Um, even if they come from up north, uh, they just go to London and forget about us. Yeah. So we have gone, really lurched from one crisis to another. Yeah. And in some ways, um, the lockdown has given us um, time and headspace to create, which we have, um, with... with um, free abandon like i said 30 odd tracks in in six months or whatever it's been is 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 pretty good going i mean really it's it's a, it's it's a phenomenal work rate but what it has also meant is is that um we haven't spent time together we haven't played live this year we've there's no dj gigs to be had and that's difficult and we're very lucky again appreciating the position we're in in that we're not worrying about the gas bill we're not worrying about the food. We both have partners who work and who support us yeah. um, in every sense of the word. Yeah. Um, and they know that when the good times are back again, yes. we'll be out there, we'll be touring, we'll be DJ, we'll be playing live. We'll be taking all of those new tracks out and going, hey, world, what do you think of this? Wow. Until that point, we're concentrating on the music we're concentrating on marvin if we have our way marvin will become not just a head of a robot but an oh, entire wow. robot um wow and we're creating new multimedia visuals we've just got a green screen arrived timmy was telling me this week so there's a green screen we might do some live streaming from timmy's studio when yeah. we're allowed to be together again obviously we're not at the moment and we're um i was watching something the other day yeah Oh, it was actually, it was Sean Ryder and Bez have got a new show on YouTube. Sean Ryder, okay. Sean Ryder and Bez from the Happy Mondays have a new show, and they put their show out on YouTube, and somebody reported them to the police for not wearing masks. Oh, my God. You're kidding? So, these are two, two guys who've been best friends for 40, 50 years. Yeah. They live next door to each other. They see each other every day. They're in their bubble. But somebody took the time and the effort to watch this thing and report them. So you will not see live videos from myself and Timmy and Marvin until we're allowed to put out live videos. Fair because there are enough. people out there, Which are for whatever reason, reporting those. I mean, those guys are hilarious. If you want to see uh, me and Timmy in 20 years, yeah, Sean and Bess, really. I sent it to Timmy and went, that's us, that is. And he went, yeah, it is. Um, but they have a, a relationship, a closeness that's a joy to see. Um, but it's wow. it's um, you know, it's it's a, it's a weird thing because in some ways, yes, of course, there's a lot of negativity. There's a, there's a very big concern with industry about musicians not being able to survive um, and having to take jobs. But of course, there aren't any jobs. Yeah, of course. Venues are closing. So let's say you want to go on tour in 2021, but 50% of the venues have gone because they couldn't survive. That's true. You know, we spent £12 billion on a track and trace system that didn't work. Imagine if you divided £12 billion between every musician in the UK. Wow. We don't between every venue, every festival. If everybody got their share of the £12 billion, uh, you really wouldn't be worrying about uh, about things. And the, the end result would be some great music. Um 
the track and trace still wouldn't work, but it wouldn't matter because everybody had to have some great tunes to listen to. Very true. That's true. That's true. Um, so, yes, we do want to get out there. We do want to share our madness with the world. We just haven't got the chance. And if we're honest, Dad, we don't know what's going to happen in the new year. We get to New Year's Eve. The virus isn't going to suddenly give up, is it? It's not going to go, do you know what? Happy New Year, I'm gone. <laughs> I love it. I love the way you done that. That was gangster. I love it. Love it. It's going to keep changing. It's going to keep moving. There's already talk about uh, mink spreading a new strain of COVID throughout Denmark. So this is going to be ongoing. And if it is, then we have to think of new ways to express ourselves. And as you've seen, we put our work out on SoundCloud. We put our work out on YouTube. These are all un official releases for the most part yeah you know we're still on single number one connected is single number one official single number one wow it just happens to be another 29 tracks that, that are out there which we'd like to call demos wow you know if if and when we select them as singles like mr moogie will actually put some time and effort and money into polishing those so they can compete with the radio but what you have there is our raw untapped vision of what our music should sound like. That's just me and Timmy giving it all we've got and making it sound as good as we can. The same with the video. We put those videos together because we love old films. We love old science fiction. We love all those. Um, you mentioned um, I Control the Nation from my power station. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that's genuine footage from a 1950s film about nuclear power. So taking that and putting it with our music, you're recontextualizing it. If you know anything about the art world, do you remember Duchamp's fountain? No, but so I Duchamp learned. took Duchamp took a urinal yeah. that he bought. Oh. He put it in a gallery and he called it a work of art. He called it the fountain. So he took something that was ready-made, so a bit like that video, we took a film that was ready-made, Yes. we recontextualize it, we repurpose it, and we say, this is our work of art. We've taken their art, we've taken our art, we've put the two together and we've created something that's better than either one of those two things on their own. So... At its very worst, it's a nice way of getting our music onto YouTube. At its very best, it's a completely different art form altogether. It's something bigger than the sum of the parts that have gone into it. Absolutely brilliant. Um, could you please tell everyone your, your socials, please? That's a very complicated thing. We've got a whole list of URLs, and the best thing to do if you want to find I'll, us I'll, online yeah, I'll paste is them to the Google. Yeah. I shall send those through to you, but if you video... Hash, oh, sorry, if you Google hashtag NSEC music, mm -hmm. you will find that all of the search results are things that we've done on various platforms. And also, so NSEC music, mm -hmm. you will find our videos on there, you'll find our Instagram, you'll find our Facebook, and absolutely I'll supply you with the links if you'd like to put them up on the screen. But it's just, you know, we do what we do, and the end point is really when we've done it. That's true. So we make a piece of music, we make a video, we play it out there, and then we're on to the next thing. And some do well, and some do not so well, and some people like them, and we comment back and say, oh, that's really nice, I'm glad you liked it, you know. But we don't have that pressure. We don't have that pressure at this time to say, it has to be this way, it has to be this product, it has to be this way, this direction. We have complete freedom. Long may it continue, Dad. Long may it continue. I, I wish to just thank you for your time. And, um, a real pleasure. No, no, it's 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 radiation. We'll support you and all your projects. And uh, thank you. It's a pleasure because you know, to be honest, for me, it's like oral pleasure in my ears just to hear hear your work. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll be honest. I'm like, I gotta interview these guys. Um, I'm bursting for the loose. I got. <laughs> Do you know what? I think my earbuds are about to run out, but it's been an absolute pleasure, Dav. And maybe next time I'll drag Timmy in and you can talk to Timmy as well. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you. M my pleasure. Look after yourself. God bless you, sir. Thank you. Take care, Dav. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.